Okay, there we go. So I hope everybody is doing well. Um, one thing, we're having a bit of a windstorm today. So if I get booted off just to just proceed and uh, maybe Daz can kind of instruct you how to wrap it up. Um, the next thing I want to make, start with two announcements. One, um, Paul Smith's courses are opening back up. I have put a link in the chat to his course schedule page. You can find that there. The other thing um, coming up, Paul had promised a special event in honor of the uh, 1,000 members in the Remote Viewing, Remote per Perception Facebook group. That event hopefully will be coming up within a week or so. Somebody just said, okay. Somebody said, if I get booted off, the Zoom conference will automatically end. Yes, I was gonna actually say, uh, you should make Daz or someone else the co-host. Okay, how do I make how do I make Daz the co-host? If you I'm gonna go actually pause the recording for a second. Hold on. The special event uh, Paul's gonna have is gonna be special and it's gonna be fun and it's going to be exclusive for members of remote viewing, remote perception. I know most of you are there. Go ahead and uh, join up if you're not. It should hopefully be within a week getting everything and everyone together, but you would definitely enjoy it. Will it be available for replay if people aren't able to be there live? That I have, um, I don't know yet. Though the details will be posted in that group. We're working out a couple of different factors. So um, if, if that question arises again, go ahead and put it in the group. Okay, thank you. Well, once we make the announcement. Yeah because it's kind of the first time for all of us to, to try to do it within that Facebook group. So, so we'll see how it all goes. Okay. okay. So one thing um, I have to say I was very impressed by is the five top five topics are all fundamental to remote viewing itself. I, I know we tend to get off in the peripheral topics, myself included, so I was kind of excited to see this and, and appreciate everybody and their interest. And this group seems to have a very high percentage of people that are interested in the mechanics of the actual process, no matter what structure you're using, interested in approving themselves. It's just great. So how many of the topics we get to will basically depend on how each one wraps up. So the first topic, was how to differentiate between the signal and the noise. And that had 41 votes. Tips, tricks, exercises, and habits for developing remote viewing skills solo at home had 33 votes. How tasking is properly created had 20 votes. Stages of learning and practice had 17 votes and how a viewer knows when to end a session had 10 votes. I see a couple of people in the chat mentioned the um, ethics. So perhaps next time we could include that by demand. I'll make a note and, and maybe start off another one of these open chats uh, on the topic of remote viewing ethics. So where to start? is going to be on how to differentiate between the signal and the noise. Since Daz, I, I can't, I'm not seeing the entire roll call here, but since at this point, from what I am seeing, Daz appears to be the one with the most experience here. So maybe Daz, would you mind starting off and elaborate on any tips or, or clues to how you first learn to recognize the signal versus noise and how that's improved and how you do it today. Um, I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't know how I can answer this one. Um, 
because I'm not actually sure that I know the difference between signal and noise other than, uh, you know, the standard CRV uh, uh, rules, which are if data comes in and uh, it's a naming word or a verb, uh, not, not a verb, sorry, a noun is, I think it is, or if it's uh, information that's out, uh, too much for the stage you're in, uh, I mark it as an AOL, which doesn't really mean it's noise. It just means that I'm identifying that it could potentially be noise. Other than that, I don't know in a remote viewing session from one to the other if one's more accurate than the other until until I get feedback. To be honest, so I don't know. I don't know what the uh, the content of noise is in the RV session until I get the feedback and then uh, mark it for accuracy. For me, uh, I just do I just do it and move on to the next RV session. Okay. Yeah. And in structure, depending on the modality, obviously I'm more familiar with CRV structure. Structure does do that sorting for you. The one thing that I have noticed at this stage of growth is that session reviews really, really help me. When I go through a session afterward, use the basic indicators in the CRV manual in terms of putting a C for correct perception, can't feedback on something that might be there, but there's no way to, to know or near the target. And then as we know, the perceptions that are incorrect, we just look past those. We, we only place our attention in that respect on the positive. What I have noticed while doing that is I do notice in retrospect. So when I'm doing that, I remember the session and then I remember, well, you know what? That one did come in kind of loud, so to speak, or that one came in as a very subtle flash. So the way I'm trying to develop it, and again, this isn't by, by the book, is that I, I do start to remember the sense of what, what came in as good data and what came in as bad data, if you will. And, and there is, there's a very subtle difference. And, and when um, Paul or other people I've worked with have tried to explain it, it's the same thing Daz says, it's subtle, it's nebulous, and, and it's truly personal. There's, I don't think there is a... a you know, guaranteed way, one of the things that I like, and I've heard several other people, including David mentioned they like, is when a word pops out that I very infrequently use or may not even fully comprehend the definition of. Mm -hmm. To me, that's always a little exciting because, you know, it's like, where did that come from? And that kind of gives you a feeling in the moment where that, that might be good data because it's, it's obviously not something that you originated yeah. yourself. When it comes to sketching, something I had to teach myself to do is to literally, and it's strange to explain, but to let my hand draw and to essentially become an observer without trying to you know, make an angle or express anything in particular. And just like the verbal documentation in the session, those sketches turn out to be more accurate overall. And how that happens, I, I can't explain. It just, if I, if I kind of, you know, maybe prompt with a question where, you know, where should I go next or what direction up, down, you know, something, just these kind of quiet internal inquiries, the, the hand will kind of just do the thing. And it's weird disconnecting and, and, and letting it, it's the best word, just let it happen versus trying to control it happening. And throughout the session, Another weird indicator, and again, it's not always reliable, is if I find myself fighting something off. Um, I had a session once where it was kind of a strange situation. 
And my mind was like, well, no, that's weird. That's strange. That can't be. Da, da, da. And at a certain point, I just had to finally break through and just say, okay, I, you know, S four and a half. I keep getting the impression of blah, blah, blah. When I, wrote, when I wrote it, to my logical mind, it seemed crazy. At the end of the session, it turned out accurate. So whether that's a clue for other people, you know, I can't speak. I, one thing this has convinced me of over time is that we each have a very unique and individualized mental theater. There's nothing, well, I mean, I can't say nothing. For the most part, we're not all having the exact same experience. I'll leave it at that. So as we get adapted to the way our mental theater presents itself, part of that differentiation process kind of starts to become apparent over time. That falls into the, the phrase that when, you know, I first started serious training that I hated is that practice, practice, practice. You know, I would have loved it to be instantaneous, miraculous, whatever you want to call it. But I'm telling you, unless you have a very, very high tolerance for sessions that don't reach the goal you would like or we would like to be right, you just you have to practice and you have to practice relentlessly. This has come up before here, uh, you know, at a point where I was getting really discouraged, Daz told the story about himself having a six month cold streak and that just put me right back on track. The, it just simply, I think, is a matter of repetition. One, because whatever structure you've chosen needs to be ingrained. It needs to be automatic. So if you go back to uh, whoever here remembers learning to drive, when you first get on the road, you're just like, oh, yeah, there's a yellow line. And oh, no, there's the white line. Oh, no. And you're just constantly. Now you could drive, play the radio, you know, have a cup of coffee, whatever, because the driving got automatized or it got ingrained to the point where it's, it's in a sense habitual. And I'm not encouraging multitasking while driving, okay? So in remote viewing, it can become the same thing from what I have found. So as soon as a certain thing comes, my hand might go straight over to the AOL column without consciously deciding, oh, I better put this over here. Now there are decisions being made throughout a session, but sometimes it'll just happen and my hand just knows. Or if you get to stage four, and you know you move along all of a sudden just your hand will go over to this column or to that column so when so so when we let ourselves express this flow of data coming in the number one tip or trick i suggest is rely on the structure number 2 is to express everything. If you're withholding anything during a session, there's a place for anything and everything in the CRV structure and other structures I'm familiar with also have, you know, similar uh, setup. And then the next thing is just practice, practice, practice. It, it's, a, it's a matter of being relentless. It, you know, if you could see the, I refer to them as condominiums of bad sessions stacked up on paper around here, um, you would understand. It's just persistence and determination, getting your structure ingrained, and then learning your own mental theater as you go. So that's kind of what my summary on it would be. Jimmy, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I was interested in describing <clears throat> when you have uh, something that turns out to be a hit, one of the words you used was it felt like it was coming in, I forget if you said loud or strong, but that suggested something to me, which is, so in the early stages of CRV, it's, it's a practice to write down, you know, sensory descriptor terms mm -hmm. at the uh, sharp, metallic, whatever. And what the question here that's being asked is, what does it feel like right. when you have a hit or something that turns out to be a hit? 
And I know it's tough to describe mental states, but I, it might be an interesting exercise for you and Daz or more experienced viewers to try to characterize what, it, what the feelings are just using those one word sensory descriptors like loud, which is a hearing metaphor or strong, which is a kinetic metaphor. Maybe there are other terms that suggest themselves that, for when you, when you have that hit. Yeah, no, and that's a, a good point. So it was actually, uh, I may have said it incorrectly, but it was the inverse for me. The more subtle it tends to be, it doesn't mean I've had subtle data that was bad, but there's, there's a subtleness. Whereas if I get something that just comes in and, you know, blah, like that, I tend to associate that with what, you know, we're referring to as the left brain or maybe it's just coming from some other logical system, but the louder it is. Um, when I first started to clue into this was in Paul's course where he would talk about the difference, uh, what he started to call valid stage two imagery. So if you get this boom, like photobomb that just drops in and it's solid and it's clear, and he threw in another little hint, it, it's still, it was a still photo. He said, that's more likely to be AOL. But if you get this and he uses the term like half remembered dream, you, you kind of get it, but you try to lock onto it and <laughs> there it goes. And so letting that thing sit there and it might be just, um, you know, like say you're looking at a, a, a farm, you might just see kind of a little band of gold or some hint of a blob that might be a structure, that kind of thing, it's, it's, it could be that, vague. And I believe Paul said the first time he had that, he could see grass moving. And that was one of the ways he indicated a um, valid stage two imagery. So, so, I so just, based, on what, based on what you've just said, then maybe terms for you like subtle, vague, slippery would characterize the hit experience, what it feels like. Right, but not all the time. And naturally, right. when I'm self-referring, I can't tell you what Dawn or Fabian or anybody else is experiencing. So I also do a different kind of subjective work professionally. And out of that has come the absolute solid realization. Each of our mental theaters is very unique. I, uh, people perceive things so uniquely, it's just impossible to, to set a standard on on these, you know, subjective subtleties. But mm -hmm. so, so when we're doing, you know, a conversation like this, it's just a best effort to, to, you know, hint towards some things. And then ultimately, and like I said, I despise the phrase. I was like, at the point of one more person says, practice, 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 I'm gonna snap. And finally, mm -hmm. when I broke down and just practice, 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 that's when these accommodations to my own mental process started to come into play. And over time, um, certainly my, my session work has become a lot better. It's, I did not start out as a natural. So, so the training, the structure. One other thing too, um, and I know it's not available to everybody, but monitoring is incredible. When you get a good professional monitor and I know, um, like for instance, Angela Thompson Smith is willing to monitor online for people. But if you're in a class where monitoring is available, that really, really helps. When, and what I mean by monitoring is the original training monitoring. So when um, I first sat down with Paul to do my first session, he said, I'm going to say correct on correct perceptions. And so you go down blue and your ears like, okay, okay. And Paul's quiet and you're like, oh, you know, and you go and then clear, correct. Um, gray, correct. Loud, silence. So, so in that initial training monitoring that they, they did use in the army unit and at least I'll just say that I know they used it in the army unit um, that live interaction and confirmation on the spot is very useful. I didn't bring that up at first because I know, you know, that's not available to everybody. But if 
uh, experienced person were to say, look, I charge, you know, X amount uh, per hour or what have you uh, for online monitoring, that's something you might want to look at. That live feedback, especially, you know, in your beginning stages is very, very useful. Did I get your question, Jimmy? Yes, thank you. Maybe okay. uh, Daz, if he has any suggestions of what his terms, you know, sensory terms for what it feels like when he gets a hit, that might provide an additional perspective. Um, I don't know if I can help on this one either. It's, it's personal to each of us, really, and I... I but what I would it mean, be for you? Uh, well, when the data's come in, I don't know if it's a hit or not at the time. Mm -hmm. I just... I kind of like... I don't know how I can describe it. I just turn myself off from from all thinking of trying to identify anything in any way, um, and really just let the uh, what I call the flow take over me. Um, so I don't analyze any of the words that come through, other than like Russell said earlier, if if a word comes through that is not in my common everyday usage, mm -hmm. I will underline that word um, because I know it is an important word. Then because you know if you're not using it every day then it's most probably not going to be an AOL word. Um, and then I'll usually go back to that word later on in what we call stage five. It. So I'll take it into stage five and break it down further. Um, but the rest of the data, I literally don't analyze it in any way at all. So I don't know from one word or one cluster of information from another, whether it's accurate on, or not. I don't even think along those lines. I'm just just recording and going with the going with the flow i don't i don't really have a care if it's accurate or not to be honest i know that sounds a bit um a bit harsh mm -hmm. it's just the way it works for me i have i have i have no yeah no no leeway with it i don't I really don't care you know it's for me it's all about keeping in the structure i'm following the flow and then i'll worry about everything else an hour later once i once i finished it all so maybe one word for you would be surprising if something comes through that's surprising, that may be a hit. Uh, possibly, yes. But sometimes surprising is a, is a, is a name word, and if it's a name word, then that's an automatic uh, ah. AOL column. Then, then maybe something like mm, unfamiliar. If the, if these words are unfamiliar; they're not part of your active vocabulary. Yes, yes, but it's not just that as well. Like um, I had an instance, literally. Uh, a few days back, uh, I did a RV session for a cryptocurrency. Uh, I didn't know what the crypto was at the time. Um, and I did some ideograms and ideograms that I've never done before. And I have a pretty common ideogram language, especially for cryptos, because the ones for cryptos, my ideograms follow what I call the flow of the market. And the markets for cryptos are like markets. So they go up and they go down and they move uh, left to right. But I did an ideogram for this, this crypto where it did a vertical, uh, it did a horizontal backtrack on itself and repeated. And I've never in three years had an ideogram that actually went backwards and then came forwards again. Um, and that, that freaked me right out, right from the very start, because I've never had that happen in three years. So I made a note of that. I said, this feels really different. This, this crypto, is, mm, something's wrong with this. I don't feel, I don't feel very confident with this. It's, uh, it doesn't feel right at all. It feels like it's backtracking. And you know that went against the grain against the other the other viewers because they all were getting some pretty good data for it and getting some pretty good flows from it. And literally uh, today, uh, when I was doing uh, research for crypt crypto news uh, briefings, because I collect the crypto news as well, I came across a report for that very same coin that I looked at, and I'd never heard of the coin be before to be honest. But I came across the news today, breaking news for it. It had a hiccup in the, in in the market. And something happened with the, what we call the blockchain technology, where it actually made a sell twice. And that really shouldn't happen with blockchain because it's all recorded in, in ledgers. And it made this double uh, sell, uh, which was almost like a double back on itself, like in my ideogram. And uh, it lost itself 463 million in the confidence in the market. So I had all that information uh, way back in a few days ago, just by the turn of a line on an ideogram that was unfamiliar and I'd never had it happen before. And I would just, you know, cause I know my own language. I knew that cause that hadn't happened to me in three years of doing crypto ideograms, that there was something a bit strange about that. Okay. So strange, unfamiliar, that kind of thing. Yes. Cool. 
and I especially get that in in ideograms more than anything else. So you could just be doing an ideogram, and it could just be a little flick of a tail on the end of a on the end of a on the end of a line or something that you think makes you think, whoa, hang on, there's something a little bit different here that needs a bit more investigation. Thank you. You know, and Daz brought up a good point in an effort to answer the question. I kind of overlooked this. During a session, I don't care, literally don't care if it's a hit or not. During a session, I'm not trying to decide is it good or is it bad. The structure tells me where to place it on protocol and I literally obey that. So I am not during a session. Another clue that he kind of reminded me of when he talked about being getting in the flow, when another criteria for me is like spontaneous. And Paul uh, refers to, to these little bursts as clusters. So I'll go down and maybe get an AOL and then all of a sudden it'll just be like round, bright, shiny, cold, something. And that little group of four or five or six things will be correct, but, but they came dit, 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 dit. If I had stopped at any point during that cluster to say, is this good data or is this bad data? That would have probably stop that little burst or that flow. And then when I get to S4, my flow is moving very nicely. And then in particular in stage six, for me, for some reason, as soon as I go to do that first squeeze on the clay, I can fill up a, a stage six matrix, which is the same as a stage four matrix in a matter of a minute, and then fill out another one and another one. So when I do the, the, the clay modeling, for some reason for me, and, and Paul refers to that as kinesthetics primarily, it just, as soon as I get my body and my hands involved like that, it just goes, whew. So spontaneity and, and um, flow are getting in a groove, whether it's three or four or five perceptions or, um, you know, a, a whole matrix page. So with that, I, I would like, if you don't mind, Coral, I know that, that you have a, a very strong intuitive process and that and that you you use a couple of different modalities is there anything that you in your process could say is an indicator of noise versus signal russell i use straight crv i'm i'm terribly orthodox <laughs> Okay, I, I, I thought, do, do you, I, uh, for some reason I picked up the notion that you did some like psychic work or medium type work too? No, no, no. I'm a straight down the line CRV. And I, uh, it does put, um, get used words for my thoughts. Um, sometimes I finish a session and I'm, I'm desperate, I'm mortified. I hand it in going, oh, it, uh, I can't believe what I've done and it was so important. I really needed to do something good. And then I get feedback saying, hey, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you just don't know. In the end, you just trust the structure and you just what Dad said, Dad said in the exact word, trust the structure, work in the structure. And that's exactly what I do. Okay. All right, good, thank you. By the way, David has had his hand up for a really long time. I didn't want him to get overlooked. Russell, you're muted. You're muted, Russell. Oh, don't worry about David. He's uh, post birthday. He can he can wait a couple of days. So, Daz, I'm not uh, tracking the chat. So, if you see any interesting questions that come up in the chat, so. The way I see it stacked here, I don't know who put their hand up first. Don is showing in my top left. So I'll go to Don. And then if we have time for David, we'll get to him. Uh, I think David actually was way ahead of me, but. Uh... All right, fine then. <laughs> All right, David, fire away. Yeah, um, when you guys were talking about 
signal to noise. Would you describe the noise itself as basically just your analytical drives? I mean, because when I go through my sessions and I look at some of my most, really most of the analytical um, or the, the AOLs, like the breaks that come up, <clears throat> a lot of them, when you strip them down to your bare bones, are, are some, some kind of relevance to the target. And then also, it seems, it, it feels like to me, like when I'm doing a session, so much of it is being just honest with, with yourself and with, with the session and just being a really good uh, record keeper. You know, like if this, if something comes up, like I better acknowledge it because I, I find often I'll disregard something and I'll, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, that was, that was an AOL, but had I acknowledged it later on down the road, you know, during the session, I, pro I could have probed it more. I could have, you know, looked into it a little bit more and maybe something would have came out of it. The, the, you know, and the rule there, and it's a very hard one, is no perception, no pre perception that you register should go unattended. So if it go, you could put it in, you know, a aesthetic impact break, a personal inclemency break, uh, an AOL break, confusion break. So between the the breaks and the other, I think there isn't a single perception or experience you can have during a session, the session that doesn't have a place in the structure. So if you're just like Coral said, just following it to the T, there shouldn't be anything popping in that's unaddressed. Now in uh, Tom's working paper, he talks about AOL and he addresses a couple of points. The major inhibitors or distractors or noise tend to be memory and imagination in addition to logic or the left brain as we call it, trying to answer the question right away. So as an example, David, in that session I showed you the other day, where I'm going down and I had gray. Well, all of a sudden my memory connected that to a cologne that I used to wear called gray flannel. So I go down gray and then AOL break flannel. So my memory just quickly, you know, without my permission, so to speak, linked gray with flannel. And then our imaginations will definitely kick in so memory and imagination, in addition to the, the mind trying to, to come up with a, a quick, you know, identifying answer. And when you, when you look through that, another note in that section in uh, Tom's working paper, he says, if you're going, if you're trying to have a visualization, most likely that is going to stimulate memory or imagination. The visualizations, as far as I've come to learn so far, if they come, great. If they don't, great. Very seldom do I get visualizations. And when I have and kind of registered it and then tried to draw from memory what I think I saw, that tends for me at least to, to fall on the side of inaccurate data. Does that answer your question, David? Okay. Don, yeah, thank you. you were a gentleman. Now it's your turn. You got to unmute. There you go. Okay. All right. So I had to write this down because I'm afraid I'm going to mess this up. I, but dying to ask this. Um, some of my perceptions are symbolic, very symbolic. Uh, for example, I might get a vague momentary visual of somebody walking down a boat ramp, walking towards someone with their hands held out, like to welcome them on board, right? And so I write down um, uh, hands out, 
and maybe I drew a, a little sketch of like a couple of arms and hands out, right? And the actual target was President Nixon walking up a helicopter ramp and then giving his classic peace thing with his arms way up in the air, his hands out, okay? Symbolic, very symbolic. So my question is, is that poor target contact or is that more like typical on-track signal reception? It, does that make sense? Well, it makes sense. And it also gives me an opportunity to introduce the fact that Paul has joined us and I will defer that question to Paul. You're muted, Paul. I, I totally don't have the answer for that, so I think... Oh, I have to say that I had just been checking an email from a student that had a problem, so I wasn't paying attention to the question. Can, can, uh, can Don summarize real quickly again? Okay, so the idea is that sometimes you'll get a, a momentary flash, vague visual of something that is very symbolic, and you're trying to, like, determine... Um, Sometimes it's difficult to determine what is actually being conveyed in there. In this particular example, I saw someone holding their arms out, and um, and then I wrote that, and then the target was Nixon wow. holding his typical peace sign way up in the air, his arms out. So I actually yeah, so got it. I got it right. But the thing was, it was so symbolic that it didn't even represent. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I understand the question. It's okay. not symbolism. It's AOL. That's an AOL. Yeah, Russell tossed that my way because I think he knows it's a soapbox of mine. There's this, there's this, um, I don't know what to call it, a theme, a debate point, a, a belief out there that there's these metaphorical things and these symbolic things, and you got to learn to stuff. Well, that may be fine for Jungian psychology, but it's not fine for remote viewing. And the reason is because at least the way remote viewing was developed, the idea produced veridical information as accurate and clearly as possible. And, and generally speaking, like what you described to say, well, your subconscious picked up this, this impression of, some, of a human with arms out in some direction. And okay, I'm having trouble here understanding what's being said. Understand. Okay. Is that somebody needs to mute their mic or something? Yeah, there's someone without yeah, the mic. Richard, can you mute your mic? Okay. So thank you. Um, oh. deep in your subconscious, the signal came in of somebody standing with the fingers out, right? Your left brain is getting imperfect information. And so it tries to find a match. It From my own match. experience, right? It's huh? using my experience, something that I've experienced and it's like trying to hit that. Well, th these kind of matches can be a combination of memory and extrapolation, hmm. right? So all of us have seen thousands of people with their arms outstretched in the course of our lives. So you may have picked up a memory of that, but it could be a composite of all of those. It's your left brain just trying to present an explanation for what it's experiencing, but doesn't have enough information to correctly interpret, okay? And, and so the goal is to be as accurate as possible. If you start having to interpret what you're getting, interpretation notoriously gets you in trouble. Ah notoriously get you in trouble. In fact, that's what your left brain is doing is interpreting in, incomplete information. So if you add you or an analyst trying to interpret what your left brain is interpreting, you get several orders of magnitude of confusion going on. So anything you get is AOL if it isn't clearly data. You, uh, so I like to tell this to my classes. I say, and this, the uh, once an army air defense officer was asked, well, how do you know who to shoot down when there's friendly and enemy airplanes up there? And he said, you don't bother sort doing that. You just shoot them all down and then you sort them out on the ground. <laughs> so, <laughs> so essentially what you do with that kind of input is you, it's all AOL. And then maybe as you get deeper into session, the data will come through more clearly because at that point, the bandwidth is bigger 
and therefore the left brain interpretations tend to be more accurate. That's why later in the session, your AOLs are usually better than earlier in the session. They're still AOLs because it's arrived at by a left brain process, but at least there'll be, there'll be more correct content in it. And ultimately you end up describing anytime you have an image, for example, in your case of someone standing with their arms out, AOL break someone standing with their arms out, okay? And you just set it aside and you continue going for the data. So what might be the data in that AOL? Obviously it's a, it's a match for Nixon, but it's not an accurate match. It's not a complete match. So what might be the data? Um, so it might be vertically oriented, horizontally at an angle, um, maybe the colors, you know, like uh, flesh colored and, and whatever color might be present, present in the perceived clothing or whatever. All of that might be accurate because that is data that the left brain doesn't normally parse very heavily uh, because it is sensory based and the left brain doesn't operate on the bare sense sensorial material. It operates on the more abstract cognitive stuff, right? Okay, so, so what I'm getting from this, Paul, is that just treat it as an AOL, put it off mm -hmm. to the side. And as you continue to get more data, the bandwidth will open naturally. Yeah. And then yeah. more naturally, I will get the correct perceptions. Yes. Don't worry about whether it's symbolic or any of that. Absolutely. Yes, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you now, very much. Now, of course, there's exceptions here, right? <laughs> there is... <laughs> Once you get into stage four, if you are authentically into stage four, people tend to want to get into stage four too soon, right? Um, don't, it, and we're all talking CRV here, but the principles apply to almost any kind of remote viewing. You, you, once you get into stage four, then the, then the uh, complex abstract conceptual stuff like nouns become more permissible. And so at that point, then it isn't just to describe, it can also be a name kind of a process. But even then, caution is advised because your left brain will try, still try and smuggle stuff through, right? Mm -hmm. So up through stage three or up through the maybe first half of a, some other kind of remote viewing session, um, you want to focus on the sensory impressions, the dimensional impressions, and, uh, and shapes and things like that. Sketching, description only, anything else is AOL. Once you get into stage four, authentically into stage four, um, then the aperture opens up, then you can start getting actual, you know, essentially uh, analytical stuff. That's what a noun is. Every, any noun is an, and it requires analysis to be, become, you know, to become observed and named. So at that point, if you're careful, you can get that stuff, but don't push it because you will end up pushing yourself into AOL if you try to hurry too quickly into that more advanced process. So, okay, really, that I think uh, does answer my question, and thank you very much. You're welcome. Sorry to go barnstorming here. <laughs> so, Paul, that actually makes me feel like I've been doing this wrong for the last six months. <laughs> so, <laughs> so are you saying then, so up to level four, just stick to adjectives? So if what mm -hmm. Don was seeing, arms outstretched, arms outstretched, I would write down like arms uh, human arms, arms outstretched. I would write that. You'd write that as an AOL. That's an because AOL. An arm okay, is the noun, AOL. and a noun is the result of an analytic process. The left brain perceives an elongated thing with five things at the end that is kind of cylindrical in shape with some certain shapes. Oh, I know what that is. That's an arm, right? So that's gotcha. the analytical process, right? So you would outstretched would be a legitimate uh, perception. So would you AOL also break arms outstretched? You put that on the side. Now, here, here's a, a further thing to say. Just because you call it an AOL doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. Sure. Okay. okay. Doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. It just means you arrived at that through a left brain oriented analytical process. Okay. So if you saw what Don did, where mm -hmm. it's let's say he's um, what he saw was arms outstretched and a blue shirt, long sleeve yeah. shirt. Would you write blue? outstretched i might i might consider data outstretched and blue yeah and and see this is the beauty of of stage three when you get into the sketching and again you don't want to rush into sketching either you, you get your sensory first and then when you feel compelled to then you start sketching 
you can sketch a kind of an outstretched shape to capture what you mean by outstretched, okay? And then you might say, okay, outstretched reminds me of, it will break, reminds me of someone stretching their arms out, okay? And it turns out to be that's correct, but it still arrived at an AOL process because it was suggested that that interpretation was suggested by your memory. Perfect, thank so, you very much. Yeah. And, and Paul is a, is a follow-up. <clears throat> so, so if the viewer is legitimately in stage four, and this image of Nixon came up, how would one differentiate whether to put it in the straight AOL column or the AOL signal line column? Well, in that case, I would probably in T put person and I might put arms and then in the D column, I'd put outstretched. And then in the AOL, maybe AOL signal, but because it's a proper noun, probably in the AOL, I put down reminds me of Nixon with his arms out, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in this case where he didn't identify Nixon, he said just a person, I have probably be AOL signal, I'd say, reminds me of a person in a blue shirt with their arms outstretched, okay? okay. What you're saying with AOL signal is that you know that this is an interpretation, but you also really have a strong feeling that there's legitimate data behind it. And that's what AOL signal means. It's an interesting story. In stage three, when we were getting our stage three training for Mingo, he said he ta taught us about AOL matching, which is where an AOL has a, lot of a large amount of truth content, even though it's still an AOL. Then we got into stage four. We were taught that um, it was called AOL signal. Well, they mean the same thing, right? They mean the same thing, but they, they were named differently. And we were all puzzled by that. And, uh, and I went to, uh, I, I stayed with Ingo in 1999. I was up getting my first book contract signed in New York and I stayed with him for a few days. We had a bunch of talks and I brought along some of my student sessions. Sorry, I hope you don't mind a story here. Um, I brought some of my student sessions along to show him because I thought he'd be really quite pleased to see how well CRV transferred even though he wasn't in the teaching process by that point. It turned out he wasn't all that happy. I think he was a bit jealous, actually. <laughs> but nonetheless, we had a good discussion. And he, and he gets us to the stage four one, and he says, what's this over here? And he's pointing to the AOL signal column. He said, that's AOL signal. He says, what's that? I said, AOL signal. You know, that's where the signal, you know, where, where the AOL is much is closer to what the target is. He says, that's not AOL signal. That's AOL, AOL matching. I said, I know, that's right. You, that's what you called it in stage three. But when you got to stage four, you changed it to AOL signal. I did not. <laughs> and I said, yes, yeah, you did. I did not. Oh, okay. Yes, sir, Ingo. You, you're absolutely right. That's, that's the only solution in a situation like that with Ingo was agree with him, even if you knew he was wrong. And, and Tom agrees with me. And I found documents that Ingo signed where he was discussing a, uh, stage four and he called it AOL signal. So he had just forgotten that. He'd just, just gone out of his head that he'd call it AOL signal. Uh, he, he'd got it stuck that he'd call it AOL matching. It just, he happened to change the term moving into stage four, which is, doesn't matter. You know, it means the same thing. So anyway, I don't know. That was a diversion. I, I no, uh, first of all, Paul, don't apologize for diversions and stories <laughs> because we all love them. So well, let me tell you about my first dog. Oh, no, no. Just oh, kidding. okay. No, no. Then after that, I'll say when I was three. So Daz, do you have, do you want to add anything on this topic? Oh, yeah. I, I just have a question to pop. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, Calvin, yeah. can you do me a favor? Can you put your hand back up? I'm, I just had her hand up for a long time. So if you put your hand back up, then I can. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and then after if Daz has anything to say, I'll go to Ida and then I'll come back to you. Okay. No, I'm cool. That's that's all right. We, I think we've done that one. Okay, great. All right, Ida, I see you've had your hand up patiently for a long time. Hello, Ida. Didn't get blown away in another hurricane, did you? We on a, well, yes, we had a windstorm. Oh, <laughs> so I, I have told to tell you, you I hey, hang on a second, Ida. I have to tell everybody. Ida and I had a phone conversation yesterday and she reminded me, we, we've been communicating for, I don't know, three or four years maybe off and on. And uh, 
she's been through like three hurricanes since that time. She lives in Beaumont, Texas, which is like the hurricane magnet of the world, you know. And so we had the, that's where the hurricane thing came from because we were talking about her experiences there. So go ahead, Ida. We'll switch over to remote viewing. Uh, well, and then we had the Colorado effect. We had the Texas deep freeze where all of Texas yeah. <laughs> lost power. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's just, I, I have this wonderful book that's in, it's called um, Living in the Disaster Zone. Oh. But um, what I'd like to, for my own clarification, because I've been, I've been struggling with this from the other method that you and I talked about that I learned years ago, yeah. which is uh, oh, right. yeah. mm -hmm. signal right. line and noise. Now yeah. you talked about sensory and I, in the class that I got halfway through <laughs> at the Rhine because of yeah. a hurricane. Um, okay. Sensory to me is sensation, physical sensation. Um, which to me also includes things like, I know one example you gave uh, when I entered that, I'm just going to use that word, you know, acute nausea because of a smell, the scent mm -hmm. of, it just overwhelmed me and I mm -hmm. had to back out of it. So when you say sensory, you're speaking strictly of how the body, the physical body responds to whatever the signal is actually actually not exactly but what you said actually helps it, it, it explain this so when i say sensory i'm talking about the kinds of sensory input that you get when you're at a location so we're talking colors and qualities of light we're talking smells we're talking sounds tactiles what am i leaving out tastes right tastes and kinesthetics as well, which is in some modes is a sensory experience. Now, what you're talking about where you were feeling nauseous, that's a reaction to a sensory. So for example, uh, I, I tell people there are, is it three really horrible smells in the world, the worst smells ever. First one is burning hair. I used to help with the branding and, you know, sometimes, and I'll tell you, oh, yeah. there's nothing awful than being downwind when a, a calf is getting branded. It just is horrible. The next thing is a pig farm. If you've ever been to a pig farm, you know that, that there's not much else that can be worse than <laughs> the smell of a pig farm, right? And yeah, the final thing, is, okay, so, and then the uh, final thing is something really big that's really dead, okay? Those I know are that three, one too. Yeah, they're the most awful things in the world. If you've ever spent any time on a farm, you know all of those things, right? Or on a ranch. So the reason I bring those up is because all of those are smells, okay? They're all smells. And as smells are just kind of neutral things, right? A pig actually isn't offended by the smell of a pig farm, right? That, that's their environment. They, they don't care, you know? But a human... If particularly if they've not had any experience with it, or find it very revolting, that smell. That's what we call aesthetic impact. It's the experience, it's your personal reaction to, in this case, sensory, it can be other things as well, but in this case, sensory things that you experience. A pronounced uh, sensory effect can cause you to react in a certain way. Now, with a pig farm or something is dead, it's you, ah, ee, ee, I, wanna, I wanna throw up, right? But it can be something very beautiful. Uh, often you'll have an AI, that, you know, Grand Canyon causes an AI in most people. Some people it's, oh, wow, you know, they feel like they're falling. Other people think, oh, this is magnificent, right? That's an AI as well. You're responding to aesthetic impact, to you're responding to the effect of that sensory experience. And Ingo picked that word aesthetic impact for a very clear reason. Uh, as I explained to all my uh, basic courses, we misunderstand what the word aesthetic means. We, it has come to mean in our Western culture, the appreciation of beauty, okay? And if you think about it, that makes sense because the things that we respond to in, as being beautiful are things that we experience sensorily first, okay? So the word aesthesis actually comes from the Greek and it means fundamental raw 
basic sensory experience. The Greeks didn't understand it only as dealing with beauty. They understood it as just sensory experience. And so when Ingo used the word aesthetic impact, what he was literally saying was that an AI is the impact that a pronounced sensory experience has on the person. Okay. That's why he called it AI. There's a lot okay. of misunderstandings about that today, but that's what he meant. And so what you're talking about when you say uh, there was a smell and you felt nauseous, those are two different phenomena. The first one is just the sensory experience in itself. And the second thing is your personal reaction to that sensory experience. And someone else might have reacted differently. So, so oh, AI is not data. It's just a personal subjective judgment, if you will, about how you're feeling about that. Exactly. I, I had, there was a practice target. And actually, it's a beautiful church in Paris. I mean, I've been there. But in the, of course, it was a blind target. I, so I had no identification. But mm -hmm. once I went in, all I could smell was death. Now, in that particular church, there's a lot of tombs wow. inside the church. And everybody else was having these wonderful experiences of flowers and the floral scent. And all I'm smelling is, okay, there's a lot of rotting bodies in here. <laughs> I so mean you know what? You've just actually expanded the discussion here. Think about this. There's three things going on in that experience. The first thing is you're detecting an organically based smell. You might even call it a, ro a rotting smell, perhaps, right? It is organically based smell. The next thing is happening is you have an AI, an aesthetic impact. Ooh, I don't like this. Eh, yeah. The third thing is you're generating an AOL out of it. Oh, it's dead. It smells like something dead. There's a rotting body here, right? So that is an AOL. So you have a sensory experience, which is data. You're having an AI, which is not data. That's just about you, not about the target. And then you have this third thing, this sort of a hybrid. It's an AOL that does relate, but it's still an analytical judgment. So in that setting, I'm glad you brought this up because people don't understand how this parses out. And that's an excellent illustration of the things that can happen when you're having an experience like that. I know, but everybody else got all these wonderful flowers. You know, when, the, when all the results came out, it's like, yeah. oh, I walked in and there's florals and I'm, I'm thinking, did we have the same target? Okay, so there's the fourth thing, psychology. You were more interested in the dead people and less interested <laughs> in the flowers. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I just, there we go. You know, I, that part to me was, uh, I just figured that was an interpretation. Like you said, I've had different life experiences. Now, the other thing that I, because I, my deal is the signal line, because I've had some practice targets where I actually read the person who gave me the target, who read the target number to me. Okay. I went to something that was happening with them instead of, you know, that little number. Cause I'm not, I am not, a, that is not my accustomed procedure yet. Okay. Um, so to me, there has to be, I mean, I keep waiting for that click of how do I recognize signal line and noise. I, I'm interpreting the word noise as uh, the confusion, you know, it's like tuning an old analog radio. Some yeah. of you may remember having a transistor radio yeah. where you had so, to tune the dial just right to get Wolfman Jack. Yeah, Oklahoma, yeah, yeah. KOMA, yeah, no. Um, so I'm going to ask you to put that on hold because there's some other folks with questions. Okay. And I also have to ask my son something. Could you go out and move the water over to the big apple tree? This is just a hose. Yeah, Okay. thank sure. you. Sorry, I'm, I'm watering my fruit trees out there, and I was thought I didn't know I was going to be so involved in the conversation. <laughs> so I asked myself. Okay, well, it. you know, I appreciate. So anyway, anyway, I like to put it on hold because there's other people waiting, and that could take a little bit while to explain as well. So we'll give somebody else a chance, but keep your hand up, and we'll get back to you. Okay. Ah, she's already muted. <laughs> okay, is Who's Kevin next? the correct way to pronounce your name? Yeah. Well, where's where's Jimmy Hold come on. into this? Uh, Kevin has been waiting a long time. Okay. Okay. He hasn't had a question. Okay. Good. 
I yeah. have a question. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, Paul, um, it's interesting that, you know, when uh, Don was saying about uh, the AOL, you know, uh, he got about, you know, the person ra raising his hands. Uh, it, it's pretty interesting because, you know, in my experience, uh, most of my signal comes as a flash, right? Mm -hmm. So flash is one word that I, you know, strongly associate with signal because anything which comes to me as a flash is, you know, it, uh, almost always, it, it's a hundred percent hit, uh, you know, with my feedback and everything. And especially this happens because, you know, uh, I, I've, I've been training myself in my subconscious to uh, perceive numbers directly. Big apple tree. Okay. Go right. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, since I've been training my uh, subconscious to perceive numbers directly, because my interest is in numbers uh, and, and, and what happens with numbers is that, you know, since, uh, we've seen numbers and, you know, it, it's in my memory. Uh, it, it's a historical data as such. But then uh, once it comes as flash, you know, any number which comes as flash is always a 100% uh, hit mm -hmm. in, 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 in my case. So uh, have, you, have you got to say something about this? Or? So <clears throat> first off, have, um, have you been very successful perceiving numbers? It sounds like you've had some success, but... Yeah, I mean... Yes, I, I have a statistical data on that. It's it's been pretty significant there. Well, so, or a period of this is a data of around one hundred days, I would say. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, from the sounds of things, maybe you're trying to go for the appearance of the number rather than the identity yeah. of the number. Yes, yeah. and that's the only way you're going to have success, generally yes. speaking. Yeah. Um, trying to get numbers through RV it, or any kind of psychic modality is really really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, Ingo played with it for quite a while and admitted failure finally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but the only way it seems to me you can do it is, is treat it as an image rather than mm -hmm. as a number. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, if you get into the SRI research uh, literature much at all, mm -hmm. you'll see them often saying that surprise is an indicator, right? So mm -hmm. things that, that just spontaneously pop at you, have a much higher likelihood of being correct. And mm -hmm. this is mostly true in early stages. Later on, it's still true, but you can, the bandwidth is bigger, the signal moves in a little slower. So even without the surprise factor, it can be accurate. But if you think about it in, in stage one CRV, mm -hmm. uh, the ideogram comes in and you respond to it kinesthetically. Mm -hmm. And then you pick out the stuff that the ideogram represents that it, that it, that is transmitting or providing to you. And mm -hmm. that all happens quite quickly. Okay, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. everybody does it at a different rate. I understand one of my former colleagues told people they had to do it in, in less than half of a second. No, you don't. There's not a time limit, right? But mm -hmm. you can you can do it too fast and you can do it too slow. Either yeah. way will get you in trouble. But the whatever the just right is is dependent on you and your experience. Okay, yeah. so but surprise always consider that anything that comes as a surprise that you haven't been yeah. thinking about is yeah. likely to be more likely. It won't always be, but it's more likely to be accurate. So, yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Daz, did, okay. you, did you want to add anything to that, Daz? Um, I can add one thing to it. Bear with me a second. Um, yeah. yeah, I couldn't tell if Daz was trying to clean off his camera lens or if he was waving at us. No, it's, it's playing up in the dark here. Uh, the, oh. I've had some success by making numbers physical by yeah. using uh, using these little <laughs> pla plastic numbers. Yeah, do, do you stick them on the magnetic backing for you? <laughs> I put them in envelopes and, and choose a specific number for each color, uh, you know, yeah. and you only need the digits zero to nine yes. uh, to make any number you want. And it actually adds a tangibility to numbers for the first time. And that, that worked quite well for me. And that makes sense because what you've done is turned it into a, into a, a number, into a thing that your right brain is happy with, right? Yeah. It's something yeah. concrete as opposed to, you know, an abstract concept that the left brain processes. So yeah, yeah. it worked for me anyway. So it might yeah, and, and that's a great, great solution. I mean, uh, it's as good a solution as you're going to get. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Des. Did, did you, what was the purpose of them being in an envelope? Were you trying to use different envelopes? <laughs> I didn't get that. Yeah, I, 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 
I purposely chose uh, numbers zero to nine because uh, you can make any number, you know, any any two three digit number out of that, whatever you needed. And I purposely uh, chose it so that because um, you know you don't get amazing a variation of colors. I chose it so that if I had a green uh, one, uh, the only other green that would come up would be a zero. So then you know you'd have curves and you'd have uh, lines. So if you had if you had in your impressions uh, uh, green and and straight lines, you knew it would be you know the right the right character and stuff. But I would then put all the numbers in envelopes, and then try to RV you know randomly what was in the in the in the envelope to to train myself to start getting uh, numbers for for lottery numbers and yeah. things like that. So the goal of the envelope is so you're actually blind. Yes. I mean, yeah. if it's not in the envelope, then you already know what the number is. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I have overlooked the fact that people that are not on video still have their hand up, and I was not aware of it. So I'm going to look at a couple of those folks that have not asked a question yet and start with Paul Cosby. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I, I had a question, uh, and it fits kind of in with what Kavan just said about uh, surprise pop up. Uh, it, the question I had was. If you do your ideogram and then you immediately get hit by a blast of data before you try to probe the ideogram in any way whatsoever, is that something that should be considered as surprise pop-up data, which may have validity, uh, or is that just noise because it's out of structure? Well, I'll throw out one thing. Are you familiar with the too much break? Uh, say that again, please, sir. Are you familiar with the too much break? Uh, I've heard of it. I've never used it. Okay. Um, when, and that can happen with certain types of ideograms or, or multiple guest all type uh, scenario. So depending on um, the situation, I would either choose a confusion break at that point or a too much break and get the pre-conscious to kind of line the data up, postpone that flow of data till you finish your AB uh, segments. So if you look in both the remote viewing manual or Tom's uh, working paper, there'll be explanations in there about the too much break. Um, I think I need to understand a little bit better what's going on here myself. Um, so in this case, of course, the standard CRV process is you take the coordinate, you do the ideogram, A and the B and so on. So are you talking about between taking the coordinate and getting the ideogram that's happening? No, what I, what's, what's happened to me a number of times is I'll, I'll put the ideogram and then I'll just immediately get hit with anywhere from three to 10 data data words you know feeling verbs okay so you've already got the ideogram down but you got all this stuff coming in it's coming out before i've okay. had a chance so to... first off are you are you strangling a parrot there somewhere I, i've, I've oh. got a couple of yellow collared <laughs> in the back <laughs> okay. okay um yeah let me think how to deal with this um and it is a discipline problem uh it is the stuff that you're getting, is it, um, does it turn out to be correct about the target? The uh, accuracy rate over quite a few sets, you know, many dozens of sessions is probably about 30%. Uh, okay. Now I'm talking just about the stuff that comes in right after the idiot. Yeah. I, I'm talking about the, the blast. Uh, okay. That too. Yeah, okay. It, so you know, there's a lot of noise in it. Session, the, the accuracy rate yeah. overall might be 80%. Yeah, so. I was just curious to know what it was that was coming in. So uh, generally speaking, if I remember back, um, I don't usually have people have this problem, <laughs> but but it can happen. It's not, it's not weird or anything. Um, I think that probably the best solution to that is taking an AOL break at that point. Um, it could be a confusion break. Uh, it could be a too much break, as Russell discussed. Um, but generally speaking, I, I suspect it's likely to be AOL. So uh, you take the coordinate, you get all that crap in, AOL break, briefly note what it is, take the coordinate again, get the ideogram, and eventually your, your left brain will calm down. 
and you'll develop the discipline to allow you to stick with the, the, the essentially process that you're supposed to follow uh, to get through it. And then some of that stuff, if it's correct, will pop up later, right? It isn't that you're telling, don't ever come back. You're just saying, wait, wait, wait your turn. And then, uh, and then eventually if, if it's, if it's legitimate data, it'll come back in. So I, that's what I'd say. I mean, if I was here watching you do a session, it'd be a whole lot easier to, to, uh, thank, thank you. Sort and problem solve, but you know, whatever. On, on the cuff, that's the best. Okay. Okay. So, first off, I don't want this to be just a QA session with me. I don't want to take over the spotlight here. So, oh, um, don't worry. I have a mute button. Oh, can I mute you? No. <laughs> nope. I'm in charge this time. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to look back up here. Oh, okay. Pablo. You've been waiting a long time. Oh, so don't worry. I see Jimmy with his hand up and he was with it before me. So no well, problem for him to go. Well, okay, how about this? I, I messed up because I didn't realize I, I couldn't see a hand up um, when you're not on camera. Jimmy had a question. Why don't you let, go? Let Pablo go first. What's that? Let Pablo go. First. Okay, yeah, great. So Jimmy, there you so go. Kind of you. Thank you, sir. I wanted just to share uh, something that has worked for me and through that example, ask a question, right? So when you start, uh, and if you like a theater or, or movies, right, that, that this analogy probably will work. So when you start going to, to theater, you probably are really eager, you're enjoying it. You start asking a lot of questions, you get lost, right? And I, I found out that that's pretty much like RV. When, when you get a little bit more tenure in, in theater, you're observing, you're enjoying, but you're not questioning yourself. You're just perceiving. And later you will come in with other people. Oh, I like this. I like that. I got this message, whatever, right? So through the, 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 the play, let's call it like that. Through the play, you, you get focused on some things. Other people get focused on other things. And well, I'm not going to go into a theater class right now, but the, the idea here is that when I do that in an RV session, that helps me a lot to prevent no extra AOLs from trying to, to discern something. But I, I found out that in some instances, I don't get the target right. I get something near the target. So my, my focus is shifted that way. And one quick question is, is, could that be because the queue was not written, you know, very specific? Or is it because, you know, I, my mind is just simply going wild and focusing on another thing. Well, if it's spring break, your mind is probably going wild. But <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess I'm not quite clear on what the strategy you were. Uh, you know, you're using this analogy about going to a movie and afterwards you're comparing notes with your friends, I think was what you were saying. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, suppose you're seeing like a scene of, you know, a fight. Some people may be focusing on, you know, the, the, the foot play and other people mm -hmm. will be focusing on the fists, something mm -hmm. like that. Practically, you're seeing the same target, but you're focusing on a different area. So instead of so getting you're, the... you're talking about viewer focus where some, some viewers, uh, just like in real life, in real life, you know, in, in, if there's an accident or something, the witnesses, some of them will notice some parts of this accident more clearly than others because that's what they're attending to whereas others will attend to something else they're all watching the same ac accident and they all have correct perceptions generally speaking but they're of different parts of it exactly yeah it's kind of like throwing paint and it splatters on some things and doesn't splatter on the other things okay um okay good so now your question was so basically in some targets, you know, usually this has happened to me in landmarks or something like that, uh -huh. which, which are big open spaces with many things. And I know you don't like this target, but I will use it as example, the Statue of Liberty, right? Yeah, but it's, it's one... a perfectly acceptable example target. <laughs> <laughs> so, so sometimes, you know, most people will get the silhouette as the, the first focus and so on. Yeah. But if I was doing the target, probably would focus on, on other thing, probably a boat passing by or something yeah. like that. So the, yeah. the other aspects will still be right. And overall, that, that, that's correct. But the analysis is focusing on the main aspect. Yeah. And, and yeah. then I got it wrong, right? 
so so is that common yes that's that, that's, that's a fairly often thing because some people will be attracted to some things in an environment and not others sometimes people will be repelled by things in an environment and not others bill ray always says is it bill i think it's him it says anytime there's something dead, he always looks the opposite direction. <laughs> so, you know, so, um, and, and those of you who heard me tell the story in my very first ever remote viewing target, I didn't get the target. I got the thing that I found more attractive instead, uh, which is the target was a water tower. I got the donut shop where they stopped to pick up donuts afterwards, right? So that was a clear case where I missed the target. I was still remote viewing, but I missed the target. And the rule there, Skip Atwater was very firm about this right at that time. As soon as he realized what I had done, he, and he, as soon as he realized that I was excited because I got the donut shop and had a good description of it, he said, it, whatever you get instead, oh, sorry, uh, it, if you don't get the intended target, it doesn't matter what you get instead in terms of remote viewing. And so that was a really good lesson for me. I won't say I never got the wrong, you know, a different, the wrong focus on a target again, because I'm sure, sure I did. But that really was a very important lesson for me to learn. Remote viewing is all about discipline. Okay. That, and that's why we, why Ingo decided to call it, it, used to be called coordinate remote viewing during the military days. As soon as it came out in public, Ingo requested, and this is, he's got, wrote this up in a letter request that we call it controlled remote viewing because that was the distinction we wanted he wanted us to understand that this is something there there is enough of it that isn't controlled you're not going to control everything in a remote viewing session but you control what you can you you're disciplined in what you can to maximize the value that you bring in a remote viewing process Paul and the other part of my question goes because you know, there are two parts of the viewing process, right? You've got the viewer, but you also got the tasker, right? Yeah. And I'm giving, you know, a little bit more of thought right now yeah. on the tasking process, because if you're tasked incorrectly, right. then you can drift of, for example, yes. this, this yeah. example of the Tower of Liberty, they could be targeting, you know, Long Island, something like that. And that's why many people well, get the yes. statue. The yeah. example I use in the example, the tasking is really important, but it's not the end all and be all. Some viewers are successfully get what they need to get despite the tasker screwing up. But you want to have a good tasker so that they won't screw up. That minimizes, you know, it takes away at least one of the things that can get a viewer off track. So you, the viewer, the tasker needs to know what they're doing, but they don't always. So, so sometimes the viewer will come to that, for, sometimes they won't. So um, exact, one of the examples I use, I, I use the Eiffel Tower as my, paradigm example because I'll never give that target to anybody, right? Because it's, it's just over, over task, right? So the Eiffel Tower, um, somebody, the tasker says, thinking about the Eiffel Tower, their tasking is describe the most important monument in Paris, okay? Well, to the tasker, that's the Eiffel Tower, but the viewer subconscious may think it's the Arc de Triomphe, right? Or they may think it's the Sacre Coeur or something like that, right? that it's some other important monument. And so that's a ambiguous tasking. It doesn't pick out what it is that the viewer is supposed to do. And so, I mean, obviously depends on what the target is, how precise you have to be. In operational tasking, sometimes you have to be very precise, um, but, but it doesn't matter. In principle, the more precise and correct and unambiguous the tasking is, the better it is. And a viewer can go off the rails because the tasking is screwed up. But sometimes the viewer will save the day anyway, but you can't count on that. Okay. Okay, good. I'll jump Thank in here with, with one thing because Paul, you weren't here at the start. And then Pablo, I don't know if you were here at the start. So what we're doing is we're working off the five uh, top things that people voted for. So tasking is the third one. So there will be um, it's not very likely we'll do it today, but there will be another one of these open chats that I host where we'll address tasking and certainly we would like Paul to come back for that. So did that answer your question? I, I better write my blog post on that before then. Huh? Yeah, I already read your blog from upside down, Paul. <laughs> so yeah. happy, Russell. Any, any Friday chat is amazing. So 
the more the merrier, right? This yes, I love these, and like I said, I was so happy that everything was about fundamental structure for CRV. I put two things in the chat. Okay, okay, let me toss this in real quick. Unfortunately, my time is limited, so I'm gonna have to tear off in about oh, probably ten minutes. Okay, um, so just keep that in mind. So, okay, in ten minutes, I'll pull your microphone. All right. I'll click the leave button. Oh, you don't know how much I enjoy being in charge in these situations. Oh, I can imagine. I um, mean, you, know, <laughs> you know, like what, four weeks in person with you where I had no control whatsoever. Anyway, there we go. You're out of control, as they say. But anyway. <laughs> All right. So I put two things in the chat. I put two definitions from the CRV manual in there. One for confusion break and one for too much break. So I just copied and pasted those. And then there was a request uh, from Ida to put a link to Tom McNear's working paper. So those are both in the chat now. All right, let me look at the people. Okay, now, oh, you know what? To utilize your 10 minutes, you indicated a follow-up with Ida? Yeah, why don't I try and, I don't know if Jimmy's question would be for me, but if it is, why don't I pick him off next and then we'll do Ida. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to uh, ask a question of Paul that we uh, had a chance to discuss before he was able to join on the topic of identifying signal from noise. Uh, Russell and Daz and Coral were very helpful in describing some adjectives uh, that characterize the feeling that they have when it, they tend to be successful. Uh, some of the adjectives were the impressions are subtle or unfamiliar, like if Daz gets a word that's not in his active vocabulary. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned surprising, Paul. I was wondering if there were other adjectives that remote viewers commonly could use to describe the feelings they get when they're on signal. Yeah, so we're not talking about adjectives you actually use as session data. data right. So we're talking how about how would you describe the experience? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So um, oh, I had a really good one, now it's gone. Um, so when I describe what the experience is like, I'll, I, I say it's kind of like a half remembered memory. It, it comes in with that kind of quality and yet you know this is new, it's not an actual memory. It's, it just happens to be like that memory, right? So um, that kind of helps me uh, identify. Another thing is, uh, Dad said it's not as active vocabulary, in my case, uh, words from languages I've learned pop in. Um, usually when something like that happens, it's probably right. If I get like in, in German, so uh, in fact, this has happened a couple of times, this word glensend, which means shine your glittery or, or glowing, right? I get glensend. And I didn't, I couldn't think of shine your glittery or whatever, right? I could only think of glensend and that turned, it turned out to be right. So I'd write that down. I've had Arabic come in. Um, I haven't had any Hebrew, but that's so old, I probably can't remember any of it anyway. <laughs> but but um, I, I have a problem with if I'm in speaking to people in one language, I may reach for a term in a neighboring language. So I've been in Israel talking to Arabs and wanted to say toda instead of shukran. Yeah, yeah. So well, that happened to me in Arab, actually in Arabic language school. And of course, we had Arab teachers. And, and my previous cognate language was Hebrew. And so I was always tossing out, and, and the words are very similar in many respects. I was always tossing out Hebrew and, and worrying that I'd have, uh, you know, uh, start an international incident or something. But anyway, no, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, but so that's oftentimes correct. And I think the reason for that is foreign languages are processed a little bit differently than our native language. Native language is strictly I won't say strictly left brain, that's a simplistic thing to say, but it is very heavily left brain oriented. Foreign languages kind of overlap a little bit more. Um, and so I think that might be part of the re reason is because those pop in the left brain doesn't even know what it is. And so it turns out to be right, usually, right? And I think that's probably the same thing with Daz is active, inactive vocabulary coming through. That happens to me. I've seen it happen with students as well. A student will pop in and say something and they'll say, I didn't even know I knew that word. <laughs> And usually that turns out to be right. Yeah, and so so anyway, it is subtle. It can be vague. Uh, it can be surprising. Um, and, and so learning what the signal is like 
isn't all of it though. You learn what the what isn't what the signal isn't like, and that helps as well. That comes with the sorting them out on the ground kind of a thing, right? Um, people ask me, what do you what do you teach when you teach people remote viewing? I say, well, you can boil it down to two principles. And some of you, I'm sure, heard me say this before. The first thing is you teach them how to recognize a signal. The second thing is they teach them how to recognize the noise, and then they sort it out from there. Now, of course, that's easily said, but there's a huge amount of work that goes into actually accomplishing those ends. Um, so learn what noise is like. And um, AOL, that's the key one. And there's several, and now see, there we go, Merkmala, I got the German word. Um, Anybody speak German? What's Merkmal in English? Um, signatures or 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 uh, characteristics. I think that's it. Characteristics, right? Uh, for AOL, like uh, a bright, brilliant picture, static, uh, any kind of you get a, a a bright image in your head, it's almost always AOL. Almost always. And if it's not AOL, it may just be close. It may be an AOL matching. Uh, using uh, comparator words like like or it reminds me of, or it sort of, those kind of things, a qualifier or, or, or comparator words, those are always an indicator of AOL. Um, well, they can sometimes be a sign of uncertainty on the part of the viewer. They get an impression as, and I might say, well, it's like red. No, it's red, <laughs> right? You're just weaseling, right? But if you say it's like a fire truck, it almost certainly isn't a fire truck. It's just something that suggested a fire truck to your left brain. Okay, so comparator words. Hesitation is another one where you, um, when you should be just going along in a kind of a rhythmic way, putting down the data that's coming to your head, you pause and you think about it a while. And then you put down what comes to mind after you've been thinking about it. That is almost always a left brain process because the left brain is trying to figure out what it is and it gives you a solution that usually isn't a solution, right? Um, let me think. There's a couple more. I have a, I have a slide, so I've stopped having to memorize these things. Um, uh, well, out of structure, like you're in stage two when you're supposed to be getting things like red and black and rough and cold and, and uh, fragrant and sweet, and you come up with historical. That's out of structure. It's almost certainly AOL. Okay. And so you toss that out. So that's a form of noise. And there's one or two more. I right now not remember what they are. They're all, I think, pretty much all in the uh, original manual. So uh, yeah. if you wanted to look at that, you could look them up there. Under the Thank structure. you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, I guess it's Ida's turn. I can, I can do the process of elimination here. And, or may, maybe she fell asleep. No, there she is. <laughs> Find the right button. <laughs> There's three buttons on this thing that, you know. Um, well, they only let me have one so that I don't get messed up, so. Okay, what we were talking about mm -hmm. builds on what Jimmy and you were just discussing, the noise and the um, uh, and how that leads to the wrong <laughs> target based on uh well, what you talked about earlier, not a well-written task. Hmm. Uh, so is noise, it can be done, you can get on, you can get that instead of a good signal because mm -hmm. the tasker didn't create a good statement. That can happen, yeah. You can get it because your personal preference, like, I'm sorry, the guy you quoted earlier, that's, I don't want to see dead bodies. <laughs> oh, Bill Ray. Yeah. Um, and what else? I mean, I'm still trying to cope with this concept of noise because I, I like being well, more precise. Uh, so the, the generally the source of noise is, is most often, it can happen because of bad tasking, but that, isn't the main source. It can happen because of personal uh, proclivities, you know, things you're either attracted to or, or not. Uh, mostly it's just the fact that this is a narrow bandwidth, that's a subtle signal. 
and your left brain is is designed to process a very robust signal. In everyday life, you walk around, you see things very vividly, you smell here, all kinds of things. You have a ton of input, right? And your left brain usually makes good judgments in that setting, almost always makes good judgments in that setting. Well, its job is to interpret data that comes in, no matter what the source of the data. So when you're in a remote viewing setting and the signal is coming through is very subtle and very narrow, particularly up front, the left brain doesn't have near as much stuff to work with. And so it's jumping to all kinds of, of wrong conclusions. So an example I use in my classes is uh, you go to a party, you see a couple of your friends over in the corner talking. They've been talking for about half an hour or so. You walk up to get into the conversation. You hear the last half of the last sentence, and you think you know what they're talking about. And you say something absolutely stupid, and they look at you and say, what? That wasn't what we were talking about at all, right? You are acting like your left brain. The left brain gets half of a sentence. And that's the that's the small amount of data coming in at the beginning is half a sentence, and then it turns it into this whole conversation that it believes is what's going on, and it isn't, okay? And that's really the main source of noise in a remote viewing environment, is the fact that the signal is weak, and the left brain has too much time on its hands, and it takes what little information it knows and turns it into this whole huge story. I mean, the blind man and the elephant come up often. It's kind of like that, right? You got these fine five blind men, one of them gets a hold of the elephant's tail, doesn't know about the rest of the elephant, and turns this whole this tail into something really totally. An elephant is like this long rope with a tassel on the end that can move around by itself. It reminds me of a snake, right? Well, that's part of the elephant, but that isn't the main thing about an elephant, right? And, and that's what your left brain is doing all the time. It's getting part of the picture and turning it into a whole picture that's mostly wrong. Okay. So, what one other? When we, get, air, oh, sorry. when we get to the thing on tasking, that's that's really going to be the ultimate penultimate. No, no tasking is just one small piece. Oh, no, one, I mean to make oh, to make the good signal connection. Well, no, because you can have the best tasking in the world. You can have a tasker do a really good job, and as a viewer, you can still screw up. It happens yeah. all the time. Okay. So, Tasking is only one piece of the puzzle. The biggest thing is develop discipline and learn to recognize noise and learn to recognize signal and learn how to tell the difference. If you can master that, you will be home free in remote viewing. <laughs> I know it's a challenge. That's the hardest part of it. It's a hard, it's very hard. It just takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of self-reflection. It takes a lot of not fooling yourself. One of the biggest, okay, so this is a soapbox. I'll hit the soapbox and then I better take off. Um, the, one of the biggest mistakes I see people out there making in all of the, the groups and everywhere is trying to make themselves right in a session. They will look really hard to find something about the session that's correct and then feel like they've been a success, okay? And what that does is tells me that person is more invested in success than they are in, in, invested in the feeling of success than they are invested in the reality of success, okay? Um, you'll find that in a remote viewing environment, if you are afraid of being wrong and if you have the strong need to be right, you are going to be wrong all the time, pretty much. You have to learn, it's, it's, I've, been, I've been talking about this Zen-like element of remote viewing since probably 1986, I, that might've been the first time I came up with this idea, you know, teaching some of the folks what I had learned from Ingo. Remote viewing is a very Zen-like thing. It's all about process. It's not about the outcome. And that, if you know anything about Zen, that's the thing. It's the process, it's not what the ultimate goal is, right? And if you can focus on the process, you'll be successful. If you always focus on the goal, you're gonna not be successful. And, and you know, that's, that's the bottom line. So, um, Learn, learn not, learn just to be mildly curious. Don't care if you get it right or not get it right. And you'll be surprised how many times you get it right with that kind of an attitude that you develop. So. Okay. Okay. I'm going to check out guys. Wait, uh, hold, nice. hold, on. Huh? Oh. hold on one second. So before you go, please never worry about jumping in and saying too much. I mean, this is why everybody's here is to get informed opinions. And we genuinely appreciate it. So thank you. You're welcome.
All right. So uh, I don't know if you told him we're going to do something uh, next Friday. I checked in with Tom. Oh, this is on the schedule. Did you already talk about it or shall I? Well, I didn't. I, I think you should because I didn't reveal okay. what it was. So, so on my remote viewing slash remote perception group, which is maybe perceived to be a competitor to Daz's group, it isn't. <laughs> okay. Um, we hit a thousand people and I told them I'd give them a reward if they hit a thousand people. So Tom McNear and I are going to do a, we're still looking at the mechanics, but probably a Facebook live for the people who are members of that group. So if you're a member of the group, you'll get the invite. If you're not a member of the group, uh, maybe a friend of yours will tell you about it or, uh, or you can join the group. There's, you know, you don't have to leave any group to join that group. It can be just another one you're involved in. Um, and so we're going to do that. I think we're talking about between either 11 or, or noon mountain time. That's where I'm at. So that would be one or two East coast. And, and I guess that, and that gives a buffer before Daz's zoom starts. Right. Does that work out right? Schedule wise Daz? Uh, I'm not, I'm not so sure on the, uh, the East coast side of timeline things, to be honest. Um, I'm starting uh, 9 p.m. GMT next week. Uh, I guess if that's the same time as today, that would be 2. Was it 2 p.m. for you, Russell? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, so it's 3 my time. So if we start at 11, we'd be done. I, I figure about two hours. Start at 11, we'd be done at 1 my time, which is 3 my time when yours starts. So that's at least a two-hour buffer. If we start a little bit later, went a little long, we'd still have enough room. So we wouldn't be okay. stepping on yours. Okay. Okay, right. Paul, is it okay to, to pitch the topic you and Tom are going to talk about? Um, I don't know. Because I'm not sure. Well, yeah, I did talk to Tom about it. I, I, well, I haven't confirmed it with him. Have I? Did well, you Tom, confirm it with him? I kind of did. I'll throw the concept out there. And if it changes, uh, okay. so, so, it, so it is. So what, uh, one of the things that... Um, hasn't been like really elaborated on uh, in any documentation I found was the process of the CRV manual creation, which involved Tom's working paper and then Paul. So, you know what, Russell, I'm, I've got to take off. So, um, okay. I'll let you continue to explain and then okay. we'll go from there. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. You're welcome. It's always fun. Uh, even though I always have to decide where are my priorities going, right? I got so many balls in the air. All right, enjoy everybody. Okay. So, so the plan everybody is this, it's been in the works for a little bit. Tom in 1985 wrote a, a manual, it's officially labeled a working paper. And then Paul and Ingo's other in-person trained students got together and created the CRV manual. So what Paul and Tom are going to discuss and reminisce and tell stories is how did the CRV manual come to be? So myself, I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be excellent. And Tom uh, is you know, look back over some documents and some different things and put some stuff together. So I don't think that's something anybody's going to want to miss is how did the CRV manual actually come into existence. Now, what I want to do, I've made kind of a semi command decision here. I, I want to, uh, we've, we've got some questions in the chat, which I'm going to go ahead and take a look at now. What I want to do is stay on just this single topic, not move to topic two today. That way we don't overload. And then Daz has a more convenient title for the video when he posts it on his uh, YouTube page. So we'll stay with this theme of sorting out noise. And one thing, um, Ida, when you were asking about sources of noise, I mean, it's, it's a full range of possibilities. One that I experienced was environmental noise. And I was very, very immersed in a session in Paul's intermediate course. He was my monitor and I wrote down AOL sirens. And as soon as I wrote the word siren, I realized um, on the highway nearby, um, emergency vehicles were going past. But I was so into the session 
that at that moment, I didn't differentiate the external siren sound to the fact that it had come into my session and I put sirens in AOL. So when we're talking about noise, it can be internal noise, environmental noise, your foot can start to itch. There could be a lot of things. And again, it just comes down to the fact that there's a place in the structure for everything. So now what I'm gonna do is move over to um, some questions from the chat. I'm gonna do it in reverse order. So I'm gonna start at the most recent one and then move back up. So let me take a look at this. Okay, one um, is from Gloria, Gloriana. And since that's more about tasking, I'm going to uh, invite you and say, please, um, when we host another open chat and tasking is the topic, come back, um, because that's going to be an in-depth topic. And, and hopefully, I'll wrangle Paul back uh, for that one. And then, of course, Daz is going to know a lot about tasking, too. So thank you for your question and come back for the answer. Kevin has asked another question. Is there a way to actively train the brain to perceive elements of surprise, subtle, et cetera, as signal in RV? So I'll take a shot at that and then Daz can jump in or if there's any other person with a direct experience that wants to add to it. I would say not. Um, surprise is surprise. And if you look at this, like say in the context of, of uh, real life, well, I mean, remote viewing is real life, but let's say out of session life, if you will, uh, you know, as a career firefighter, every time the bell hits, it's a surprise. And you don't know if it's gonna be, you know, someone that just doesn't feel well, a car accident, a fire, whatever it is. So the surprise aspect is uncontrollable, but our training. So let's say, you know, we, I, you know, we, we train on cutting a car open to extricate uh, patients from the car. You train, you train, you train, you train, you train. And then when the surprise comes, you have a built-in response. You pull up, you know where to park, you gotta make sure the vehicle's secure, there isn't gas leaking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in that sense, I would defer back to, to structure, train yourself in the fundaments, and when the surprise comes, you know how to handle the surprise. That would be my you know, philosophical answer. Daz, do you have anything on that? Um, not an awful lot. I mean, it's hot. You know, uh, you can't train. Uh, you can't train surprise. Um, but surprise is only a, a small proportion of the uh, uh, the RV experience and the flow. I mean, you know, the majority of my, my data, if I if I cast it down, will probably be ninety five percent just normal flow without without that surprise information. And that data would still most generally be be accurate if you followed the structure and. Uh, yeah, don't allow the structure to contaminate with noise or, or to grow the noise. Um, so yeah, just you know, just carry on with the flow and keep to the, keep to the structure. And what I do is, um, and I still do this today. You know, twenty odd years later, is as I'm writing all the CRV. You know, because most of you will be using CRV or a method like that. As I'm doing it, I say to myself in my own head, okay, I'm going to make this the cleanest. Uh, best looking remote viewing session I've ever done. And I really take particular time in writing you know, the page number. So, I write, I, so I'm going to write page number really nice and clear there. And I focus my intention on doing each of these separate little elements so that my mind isn't thinking about what the target is. So it doesn't allow me to generate any noise. I'm thinking about doing the cleanest, best focused RV structure like I could possibly do. Uh, every time I try to do it, and then that that keeps me in the flow. That's that's what I can offer on that one, really. Yes, and and I have to agree with that. You know, like I said before, you know, I didn't start this as a natural, and in our basic course, you know, my <laughs> course feedback was, hey, you know, you seem like a nice guy, and you're determined, and you know that that'll serve you well. So. 
I committed to structure. And, and one thing I do get complimented on when I work with people um, or taskers is, is a very clean structure. And by doing that, the surprise to me was by intermediate, some good things came in and by advanced, you know, I had some really solid sessions. I named a target, a couple of clay models are spot on. So I can only say, you know, structure is the importance. And so at the point, that's the only thing I had, I, I wanted to make sure it was darn clean and readable and um, presentable and accurate. And by doing that, because that, that's the only thing I could control at that time, by intermediate and then advanced, and then now after having some operational experience, that structure literally produces the data. And so that's what I'll say on that. Uh, a question here from Cedric. As we are living in a world filled with images and have been exposed to thousands of movies since childhood, do you think it affects the amount of internal images that pop up in our brain while doing a session. Would someone from a screenless society be less prone to AOL? So that's an exceptionally good question. And I'll throw my pitch and then if anybody else has anything to add. The, sometimes the work that I do personally with people outside of remote viewing, it's amazing how many times when they start to formulate a vague memory of their own, how often it relates to a song or how often it relates to a movie. So it, it definitely, by having all of that memory stuff available for association, similar to what Paul said, you know, it, it comes up as a, as a man maybe with his hand stretched out, but you, like Don said, remember Nixon. So your mind's association, not necessarily a symbol or a prototype, your personal association is a picture you saw of Richard Nixon. All I can tell you about that is that when it comes in, place it where it belongs in the structure, but I have seen where that type of thing is diminished between when I first started and now. So how that works for everybody else. And then the last part of the question, would someone from a screenless society be less prone to AOL? I myself, and I see dad shaking his head no, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, say something that I witnessed that, that would lean towards a possibility. I used to attend this community college where they had a huge contingent of non-hearing people taking American Sign Language. And they would all sit at the same table, like 30 or 40 of them at, at lunchtime. And I looked and at some point I said, that boy, there's such a, there's a, a quality difference between this person's face and their, their spirit. And at a certain point after talking to a couple of people that were part of the group that could also hear, it turned out that the people that had this extreme innocence and pleasantness had been deaf since birth. They had no garbage in. So in one sense of the word, no garbage out. And then people who had a more, you know, almost, I don't know how to put it, D disgruntled or, or some kind of look were people that had gone deaf later in life from uh, ear infections or, or uh, injury, that kind of thing. And getting to know one of the instructors of those courses later, they confirmed that people, uh, you know, one thing, if you lost your hearing after having it for 20 years, there, there is a, a bitterness about that or an upset, obviously, that anybody would feel but in that notion where these people just had this, they, it was a childlike quality. That's what I'm trying to say. They have been deaf since birth and they hadn't taken in all this stuff. So my theory, in spite of dad shaking his head, <laughs> is that I think it's possible that reduced mental contents could in a certain way lead to less AOL. 
but that's just a personal theory. Okay, we'll move up here. Actually, I had uh, something to add. Since yeah, Jimmy, go ahead. Um, so a, a couple of quick thoughts about that. It's a very interesting question. Um, part of me is a little skeptical of the mere idea of images in our culture of screens, in our culture affecting this because all humans are primarily visual creatures. So even if you're not looking at a screen, you're looking at something, uh, regardless of what kind of society you grow up in. You know, if you're living in the jungle, you're seeing the jungle a lot, but you're still getting all that visual input. On the other hand, there, in the era when uh, movies and TV were primarily in black and white, a lot of people dreamed in black and white. Mm -hmm. And that could suggest that what you see on screens has an effect on your subconscious, which produces your dreams. And thus maybe it could have a role here. In terms of one thing that affects our culture that strikes me could play a role here is how analytical our culture is. Um, for example, you know, we have an elaborate number system, whereas in some cultures, the number system goes one to many, you know, you, either there, you have the number one, you have the number two, and anything more than that is just many, so that um, they don't, they don't have the same degree of numeracy that we do. And it could be that our high level of numeracy makes it harder for us to judge numbers, like get the shape of a number or something, because we have so much, so many numbers in our heads all the time. Um, other, another thing that could relate to that is we categorize things in our culture differently. Uh, there have been anthropological studies where you ask a person from our culture, okay, here are a bunch of knives, here are a bunch of potatoes, group, how would you group them? And we would say, well, the knives all go together and the potatoes all go, all go together. But in other cultures, uh, they sometimes want to pair a knife with a potato because you use a knife to cut a potato. And so maybe some of our cognitive style could have an impact on the kind of analytical overlay that viewers report. Mm -hmm. Just an idea. Sure. In the, in the complexity of our internal worlds, the fact we still don't know fully how the brain works, then the argument is there a difference between the mind and brain. You know, there's got to be so many things outside of our knowledge that, that are affecting us. And even with that as the case, you know, we can proceed with, with remote viewing without explanation. In other words, there's this little book that I read once called Operational Philosophy. And it explained that you know, I don't know how car ignition and battery and all that stuff works, but I can turn the key and the thing starts. So I have, in my struggles, I want to know this. Where does the data come from? How does that go? Da, 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 da. You just got to stop it at some point and do it. And, and I think, you know, all of these things in the conversation and all is wonderful, but at some point we just have to surrender to the fact we, we don't currently know and we may not know some of the answers, but that does not stop us from sitting down, turning the key, starting a session and being successful. So that's how I've had to arrest my own, you know, wanting to know everything and, and finally facing the fact that I don't, and I probably can't. All right. So- I have something, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt. This is actually an experiment I did in the year 1986, and it was based on a really crazy uh, religious idea, but. For one year in 1986, I did not uh, look at any magazines, use telephones, uh, anything with speakers, anything with an image or a likeness of another thing. For a year, I did that. And it was interesting because it was before the cell phones or the internet. And um, I learned a couple of things. First of all, my intuition, wow. It, now that I know what C CRV is, but for sure, my, infant, my, my uh, intuition, for sure, it got four to 10 times better. And now that I think of it, I said, what the hell am I doing on the internet? But it really, I, if, if you can somehow, uh, there's, there's this fanatical idea I saw in the Bible. It was one of the Ten Commandments, and, and with respect to the people of the Bible. But it, it says, uh, um, do not use a likeness of anything. So I took it way too seriously, and I tried to, again, no images, 
no movies, no books, no telephone, no speaker, and lived like that. So I learned two things. One, stick to your word. Learn to stick to your word and don't vary from that, which also helps your conscious enough because you're very clear as to what's creative and what's serious and you have to stick on one line of the truth. Because if you're dealing with people, you have to know where they're going to be at what time or where you buy your food or the practical necessities of life. So I, I didn't even think about it until you were speaking, Russell, but I would personally say my experience for sure, if somehow you could get out of this culture, this modern culture we have with all these images, I promise you in a year, your intuition will be way better. But that's just my experience. Okay. No, and that's good input. And it brings to mind one of my favorite Buddhist stories. Um, there's this Buddhist monk finds a cave. He's perfectly isolated. There's no distraction. Ten years go by and boom, he has realization. I'm enlightened. He walks down the hill, gets down to the edge of town, goes across the street to go tell the village that he's enlightened. Somebody beeps at him in the car and five seconds later, he's in a fist fight. Okay. So when we're isolated or not contacting these things, it, it does settle things down, but it doesn't necessarily create a permanent state. And uh, it was mentioned earlier when Ingo switched from uh, coordinated to controlled. If we can learn to control that state, at least for the period of a session, that's where our progress will come from. And like Paul said, it is, it's a discipline. Ida made a comment in the uh, chat about intention. Set your intention. Like Daz said, just, just decide. All I care about, I just want the best structure, the best page two number written and control it and, and for the period of the session. The other ideas of meditating or avoiding um, extraneous input, those are great and they might facilitate it, but they don't guarantee the, the stabilization of that state. All right. Now this one, I can't tell who it's from. I think it's from Bliss, but the name is abbreviated. It was uh, referred to as a follow-up question. So there is no physical quality in your sensory experience, such as tingling toes or ears or goosebumps. Daz, do you want to take a shot at that? Um, I think I've said this in the past. I don't have any physical sensations whatsoever when I'm doing RV. Uh, okay. Every sensation, even the sensory ones for me are just, are just words, words okay. on a page. I don't smell the target, don't taste it, don't touch it in any way. I don't feel any temperatures. They're just, they're just words, that, words and feelings that come to me. And the, the first one that comes, I, I just write down. I have no sensations whatsoever. I'm literally just sat there with a cup of coffee and my tablet drawing, drawing stuff. Mm hmm Okay. Um, I'll throw one uh, personal experience out. It was the first time it happened to me. Paul had given me my very first movement exercise during a session. And he started out saying move on a heading of, you know, 236 degrees west to an elevation, all this stuff. None of which my logical mind understood. I'm, I'm not, I didn't have that kind of uh, background. Okay. 236 degrees, what does that mean? Anyways, all of a sudden it felt like, if you can imagine like being at the bottom of a bungee cord and then suddenly lifting up, I had that sensation completely unexpected um, to the point where I felt a little queasy. And when it happened, my hand just drew a line and put an X at the end of it. And Paul was like, what was that? And I'm like, you know, I don't know. So later when I looked at it, the line was in correspondence to the size of the target, approximately to the elevation Paul had indicated. And when you looked at 360 degrees, it was at the um, degree mark. So that was something I didn't logically understand. It happened out of the blue, but I did have an associated body sensation then over time that went away. And so Daz is saying he, he's not having physiological reaction. 
So again, I think that falls in the category of this person versus that person and, and their unique perceptual systems. Okay, let me look up a little more and see if there's another question here. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, you changed the spelling of your name. Canal or how do you pronounce your name? Uh, is yes, you. Cow. Cow. Okay. Cow. It got some, it looks, didn't you, did you add more to it? It looks longer. No, than no, it. it's just, I normally don't always say the full name. It's cow meat, but cow is good. Okay. Like cat, cat goes meow, meow, cow. Okay, so you know, here's a question you had asked in the chat. If people that have done at least hundreds of sessions now have yep. gone back, have they gone back to check their ideograms relative to their successful session? Yeah. I never have myself. Oh, each session is completely unique. Is somebody playing the banjo? Oh, sorry. That's you. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's fine. I thought I'd change channels there. Um, so I never have. I'm not trying to associate an ideogram with anything. I want every single one to be unique and spontaneous. Daz has pointed out correctly, and Paul agrees that um, one might begin to have a similar ideogram for particular um, phenomena. But if you get caught up in optically interpreting your ideograms, from my experience, that's a mistake. You still, even if it's your traditional ideogram for water, you still wanna do a full A and B segment and let that process take place. Don't just look at it and go, oh, it's wavy, it's water. So, but does that mean that, that you, I mean, it doesn't eradicate the fact you might get a similar ideogram when you're dealing with water, just don't optically interpret it. Yeah, and, and my question was based on uh, Daz's familiarity when he was explaining the, the cryptic session where it went back and forth. That's kind of what inspired it. So I think that's really for a different discussion. So thank you for answering it. Oh, sure, no problem. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, uh, I just want to add to this discussion with sure, Kiao. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I've been thinking of different ways of, you know, amplifying signal and, you know, working with noise and stuff. And as Kiao just mentioned, uh, what if there's a way of intentionally programming your mind in order to, uh, uh, you know, uh, expect the mundane, right? You know, uh, put yourself and train yourself to, to do the mundane things. And once, uh, there is an element of surprise coming in and it's easily picked up in a sense, right? And that's probably what even Daz does when he's like, you know, intentionally, uh, you know, making a note before the session, like, you know, he has to do it right and, you know, things like that. So the intention setting is, is really good. But then, you know, I found this paper, uh, it is a 1964 paper, much before CRV or any remote viewing was discovered, where they discuss, you know, where they're, uh, you know, distinguish, uh, you know, different kinds of ESP methods, but then there's a very uh, interesting structure as uh, it is discussed in the paper where they intentionally do this, that, you know, you intentionally focus on, let's say an image, you know, put all your brain, your intention, your, uh, your entire focus is on that. You increase the, uh, you know, um, expectation value there and, and, and then just all of a sudden just let go of the image or whatever that is. It could be an image or it could be just like a black screen in the mind or whatever that is. And then, you know, there's a way in which the, the signal gets into your mind, kind of a sense. It's, it's very beautifully described. And uh, I will just go ahead and share this paper with everyone. Uh, seems like a, a really useful one for uh, the kind of discussion that we are having here. Oh, you're going to so, put it in, you're going to put it in the chat? Chat, yeah. It's, oh. uh, it's an ASPR, okay. Association of Cycle. Yeah, psychical research, American psychical research, yeah. Yeah, and that's where, of course, Ingo started most of his officially documented um, work. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you a little bit of a trick question. What's the difference between amplifying the signal versus mm -hmm. increasing your focus? 
Yeah, I think uh, when you're increasing your focus, you're just using the brute force. Like, uh, it's just your, uh, you know, you're using the mind power, as we call it. It's basically the analytical mind. Okay. You're trying to focus on, uh, uh, you know, when you're when you're trying to increase, uh, you know, you, um, you know, your intention, your focus, and things like that. Uh, you, you're just making the mind, you, you're utilizing the brain as much as possible. You're trying to focus it, uh, the analytical mind on one particular image as such. But that's not a uh, signal there. The signal is essentially when you basically, uh, you know, intentionally get out of the mind in a sense. So if there is an in, intentional practice that you come up with where you try to get out of the mind, I think that is where signal happens. And that is where we see elements of surprise, subtleness, flashes, and things as such. Along the theme of controlled remote viewing, mm -hmm. which of those can, which can you control? The signal or the focus? Yeah, it's, it's definitely the focus. Okay. And, yeah. and the reason I came to this, and, and yeah. this came, um, you know, not from me, but from conversations and, and from suggestions from other people, I thought at a certain point, um, targets in, in stages of training would become more complex. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when I started a certain phase of training, I had a target and I, I, I won't say what it was, but imagine if somebody said an empty beer can in the middle of a hundred acre field in Texas and you were asked to view that at midnight. That doesn't have entropy uh, or what some people associate with signal. Mm -hmm. And once I realized it, it, if, if you're asked to view that, it's going to be your focus exactly. that solves that yeah. problem. So yeah. I see people wanting to find, you know, is it, I want a louder signal or they say Daz targets have more signal than so-and-so's targets, that kind of thing. The only thing we can control is the focus. Precisely, yeah. You can ferret out the beer can in a Texas field in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. something you can do. You can't make that beer can or that field louder. Exactly. Absolutely. No, that, that, that's precisely when, you know, I think, you know, right next to focus is where the structure comes in. You know, you follow, I think the structure is really important. And then along with it, you go with the focus and then, you know, bring in the, uh, bring in different elements of, uh, you know, increasing the signal there, if any. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge Sylvia who said, thank you all. Very interesting session today. I'm looking forward to more and learning from you all. And trust me, I have learned today. And even though I've been through classes with Paul, he'll say things uh, in a different way or a new. So I think we all learn. Um, and, and I appreciate everybody's input here. All right. So let's see. Um, could I uh, follow up on something that Kit, uh, Kit Kavan mentioned earlier? Absolutely, yes. Um, first of all, Kavan, am I saying your name right? Uh, uh, actually, I go by Kavan, but then coming to the US, I've become Kavan. So <laughs> it's good to be. Kavan, okay. I always love to say people's name right because so few people get mine right. Um, it's, so you have a project where you're um, focusing on viewing numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, Daz mentioned something that was very interesting about putting numbers in colored envelopes, which um, is, I, it sounds like a kind of associative remote viewing. Perhaps I have that wrong and perhaps Daz can clarify. But one thing that occurred to me is some people have a, a condition called synesthesia. Um, the most common form of it is called a uh, graphene color synesthesia, where you associate letters and numbers with colors. I actually have that. For me, three is a purple color and four is a kind of sea green color. And this synesthesia could reflect because the processing happens subconsciously. I just see a number or a word and associate it with certain colors without consciously trying to do that. Uh, Pablo says three is blue for him. Cool, fellow synesthete. Um, but uh, maybe perhaps as part of your project, 
looking at synesthesia and how associating colors and numbers, perhaps on a subconscious level, might might play some useful role. Okay. Yeah. Good. So now those of you that still have a hand up and your question's been answered, if you could knock that little hand down, I would uh, thank, thank you very much. Okay. This is a question in the chat from Demi. Question. Paul was talking earlier about getting too quick or incorrectly to stage four. I know the rules, the structure, at least I think I do. Are there special requirements to go to S4 besides structure? I'll take a shot at that and then Daz. And also uh, I noticed in our audience, Brett Stewart's hiding out there. So Brett, hello. And if you have any input you'd like to throw in here uh, as we go, and we're probably gonna go about another 17 minutes and then wrap things up for the recording size. Everybody wants to get to stage four quick. And I you know, can't tell you how many times that I had to be restrained from that myself in training. The important thing about that is somehow I'm, I'm starting to get the sense that my system knows when it's time to switch gears. This once again falls into this signal noise, uh, unique perceptual systems to each of us. So I'll just lay mine out there and then uh, anybody else can chime in. I wanna get through stage two to the sketching and then I wanna get to stage, uh, go from the sketching to stage four where you get into the, the good stuff. If I were to put it into terms for myself, I would say the, the connection to the signal line is progressive. When you look at the concept of apertures, you're, you're uh, like a camera aperture, it opens a little bit, then it opens a little more, and then it opens a little more. So now I used to try to get away with like half page of stage twos, you know, black, green, red, well, okay, now I wanna sketch, no. So now I'm doing sometimes three, four, even five pages of stage twos. When I start to, and Paul gives clues in his training, if you get a cluster of four or five dimensionals when you're doing stage two, that is indicated in a sense, and I'm, this is purely an analogy that I've entered the space and now that I'm in the space, I can feel the space. So when you're moving to, the data will naturally progress. So if you're going down and you see that little cluster of dimensionals, you can kind of make a self inquiry. Am I feeling anything about, yeah, I'm feeling bored. Okay, great, AI break bored, now go to stage three. So remember in stage three, you'll still be listing stage twos as you sketch. And so I'm doing stage three and suddenly I'll start to notice some stage four data coming in. So all of a sudden, um, you know, the religious, this uh, industrial concepts start to come in. That I will take as a cue to switch to stage four. So by fully experiencing each stage, in stage two, you'll feel the space open up, which will usually give you some sense of emotion, your personal emotional response. Stage three, for me, when I see concepts starting to come in, that means that my system is ready to go to stage four. So that's the little clues I use. Daz, Brett? Um, I'm a bit different now. I Because most of the time, I, uh, I don't stick strictly to how CRV works. I just go with the flow of what the data does, dependent on the task at hand. Like for crypto viewing stuff, um, it's not really, a, it's, it's got a slight CRV structure to it, but it's got more of a, a flow necessary to get the information I need for, for crypto stuff. Um, so for me personally, I just go with whenever I feel like now, because, you know, I've been doing it over two decades, when I feel like I want to go to the next stage, uh, I just go with my, my kind of gut feeling. But, you know, if you're doing it the proper way, I would do it. I would do it. the And the way I would teach was, would be what, what uh, Russell just said. And one, one thing too, uh, Don had made a, uh, 
suggestion for a topic, how does a viewer know when a, a session ends? That will eventually be covered in these open chats. And so before that, there may be more questions and then people can uh, you know, discuss that specific aspect. How do you know when to end a session or when it's over? So this topic will probably be somewhat revisited. Uh, Brett, did you have anything to add on uh, internal cues to switch stages if you're hearing me? Okay, he must not be hearing me. So right now, I don't see any further questions. Oh, wait, can you hear me? There we go. Ooh, Sorry, now, my mic wasn't turned on. I don't know if my camera turned on. My favorite working. technical genius didn't turn on his microphone? Yeah, no, it didn't. Oh, it man. It was not, wasn't on the right one. <laughs> You've helped me with all these technical problems. Remember, turn on your microphone. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could give you, I guess, my perspective on it. I mean, obviously... Yeah. Uh, I don't, I mean, I use here, I use a mixture. I mean, I've, well, let me back up briefly here. I use a mixture of methodologies uh, and kind of similar to what dad said, you know, I've been doing it for so long that I kind of just go with what feels correct for me at this point. Uh, I was originally trained though in a slightly different method where it was very, very structured as far as where the, uh, the break points were when you shifted from one stage into another, where there was a certain level of, there's an expectation of getting a certain amount of dimensionals before moving from, for example, stage two into stage three. There was a certain amount of time that was more of a rule of thumb that you spend in stage three, which was usually not that long. Um, again, this is not something that most CRVers do, but it was only about 30 seconds probably at most uh, in a stage three sketch before you immediately jumped over into stage four. And uh, it, it worked for me. Um, it, it seems to be from my experience, having kind of gone through and learned many different methodologies and kind of landed on the one that I like the best, uh, which is somewhat of a mixture of a number of them, uh, is kind of also it's just feeling it out is like similar to what you described, Russell, is like, you know, if you feel like you have more to sketch intuitively, then that's probably what you should be listening to before you move on. Um, and then it's also just feedback. It's experience and feedback. It's like, okay, you did that test to see how well, you know, review your feedback. How good was the session? Well, make sure you have a scoring system in place. Make sure that you have a way to evaluate how good of a session it is without uh, over justifying data. That was something that I tell a lot of the students that I work with this is what Paul talked about earlier. It's a huge thing for beginners. It's like, no, if, if, the, if the round circle, don't force it into the square hole. <laughs> it's, you should don't do that. Like, a, like be very, very critical with yourself. And so uh, that also helps. But I, I trained originally, it was a very, very rigid structure. It was always stage two required a certain amount of data, spent a certain amount of time in stage three, and then immediately I jumped over to stage four. That does work. I'm not so sure it's maybe the best method, but it's what I started with. And then I'd say today, it's just more, I, I listen to what my intuitive kind of sense is telling me. If I, if I should be staying in stage three longer, I do that. Uh, if I get the sense that I should move forward, I do that. And so it's just kind of become uh, a, a sense, an intuitive sense at this point. But either way, having some sort of a structure, I think is, is helpful for, for beginners. Yeah, so I guess that's my opinion on it. And my, you know, my opinions are, you know, at the stage of beginner, uh, because, you know, even though, quote, unquote, I'm an advanced remote viewing student in Nepal, that's really, being an advanced student is actually just the beginning, barely. It just means that I understand the structure. I've applied it a certain number of times, had a certain level of success. So what's going to change for me? I don't know yet. Will it become more of a, of just like you and Daz have adapted certain formats to yourselves, I can't say. I'm just an advocate of where I think people should start and that's with a structure and um, sure. how you choose that or how that goes, th th that's obviously up to you. Um, if everybody doesn't mind, I'll tell you a rather sad story about data fitting that still embarrasses me, but will maybe make you laugh. Um, so my very first homework out of basic you know, you're wanting more than anything to be right. 
you wouldn't be right. You want to impress Paul. You want to prove to your girlfriend the money was worth it. You've got whatever going on. And so I got my first homework. And the way Paul does that is, you know, you have your homework and it's all sealed in different envelopes. And uh, then you open the feedback. So I was off significantly, but I did see like red and white and a hill. So I thought, well, you know, I couldn't be that far off. So I had uh, decided to fully research the entire like history of the, the site, the geological history, the whole nine yards. So I had things like volcanic and, you know, so then I found out, you know, in the Jurassic period, there was a volcano in that area. And so I wrote Paul a four page explanation for how my session was correct when it wasn't. Okay. And Paul was kind of like, uh, yeah, most rocks are from volcanoes. So um, good job kind of thing. And it, it came back to when he talked about the surge to be right. Now in retrospect, it's just horrifying and embarrassing, but I literally typed out for, well, I even went to the, uh, you know, the weather cam in that area. And, and so I had the weather right, this, that, the other, and it was just a miss. That's all it was, just flat out miss. And once I learned to swallow that pill, um, the urge to data fit calmed itself right down. I have one thing I could add to that is I think if you change your perspective on misses, it can actually be very useful as a beginner because a miss is not an end all, it's not a failure, it's a learning experience. If you change your failure into the idea of I'm learning from it and that there's a part of your mind also that, hey, you ran a session, did you stay in structure? Did you do a good job as far as the method that you're learning? You did, great, but if the data didn't fit, well, you did your job consciously as best as you could and that there's a whole learning process I think that goes on on the other side of the spectrum that the subconscious is doing. It's trying to figure out how to do this too. And that takes practice, that takes feedback, that takes time. And some people get it a lot more quickly than others. But if you turn your perspective around on, oh man, I, I'm wasting my time, sh you know, shoot, you know, to, okay, I didn't have a hit, good to know. Did I, and check your structure, no, my structure was good. Let me try again. I know I'm gonna make progress if I keep up. And everyone I've worked with, I mean, myself included over the past 11 years, is that that persistence pays off. And so uh, changing your your perspective, your mindset is a very, very powerful thing. It'll help you out when you have those misses. Don't beat yourself up is, is I don't know, is the way I look at it, so. Absolutely. And for future reference, Mr. Stewart, next time you're lurking out there, let me know. I would have invited you in a lot earlier, you know, to mix up the opinions. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Thank you, though. All right. So we're at T minus four minutes. Is there anybody that's been harboring a question, staying quiet because they're shy, that wants to take advantage and pop out and ask a question here towards our wrap up? I got a quick one here for you. Okay, go for uh, it. Um, in terms of the sketching stage, sometimes I feel like I'm misdirecting myself. And, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about that. Um, it's almost like visual AOLs where I'm going off in the wrong direction. Any quick comments, notions, tips about that kind of thoughts? It, it goes back a little bit to, to what I was saying. It's the letting let your hand draw. Mm. So as another example from course, I was self-analyzing during a session. Well, what is it? And so I'm asking Paul, Paul's a monitor. What does it mean if this, or if I think I hear that, or, you know, and, and so um, I'm not saying this happened, but if you could actually make a fine Mormon gentleman pound his fist on the desk and say, just sketch it, that might have happened. And so I just, I was like, oh, fine then. And it just kind of went like this. And when we got to the feedback, believe it or not, that was one of the most accurate sketches I had done up to that point. Mm -hmm. I was frustrated. I wanted to understand all of my internal processes right on the spot. Instead of being focused, I'm self-introspecting and analyzing and da 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 da. And when he told me basically shut up and sketch, and I was mad enough or frustrated enough 
that I didn't care. I didn't try to control it. I just like, you know, rebellious child. Fine then here. And I was shocked at the elements of the target. In fact, it was like the silhouettes of everything I did that in that fit there corresponded to the target. So that was my first breakthrough on it. I, and I tried earlier to explain a little bit of that disconnect. How do you just were you were you scribbling at all? Where or and then you you saw something in a scribble that you I reacted? saw nothing. I've very I've drawn dead accurate sketches and never saw a thing. I never saw a picture. So this is all by feel then. <sighs> It's just the, the, like the word I, I it just let, let your hand. So, so how about this? Um, so you're well, putting dishes away. Everybody's had something like this happen and a cup slips out of the cupboard and you just reach over like a, a Shaolin priest and catch that cup before it falls. You had no thought. You didn't say open hand, move hand to the right put hand under cup, feel cup, close hand. It just happened. All right, so an intuitive, just a, an intuitive sort of a thing. Muscle memory. I could give it yeah, a muscle, it's just, it, it, muscle memory. Yeah. There, there could be, yeah, there could be some element. Now you, you haven't caught a hundred cups so that your muscles memorize it, but it's like your body knows what to do. And Ingo had a different way of expressing this where, where he talked about your like your bio warning system concept where your body can tell you things before you yourself become aware of them. Oh, okay, um, uh, this is really different from what I thought. This is, you're talking about sketching without thinking about what it is. Correct. That's what I mean by let. So every time I've gone to a thing and say, well, you know, I think I'll put an angle here or so, I, 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 the first time I actually succeeded at it, um, actually, I believe that was with uh, Brett as a monitor and this target I can talk about because uh, it's not a class target or whatever. Brett had given me a target of, um, it was a, the feedback image was a guy in a silver suit on the edge of a volcano. Do you remember this, Brett? Oh, of course, yeah, it was a yeah. great session. And so I, I just sketched and I did it rather quickly. And Brett had been giving me feedback. I, I think we did uh, 12 sessions over a course of time like this. And I just, I just let, you know, let it flow. And I darn drew the vol volcano, the water, the smoke coming out of it, put a little X where I felt like something was. And it turns out there was a village there. And then I had like lava flow going into the water. Now that, didn't show in the feedback image of the close in on the, the, the fire and the person in the, the uh, fire retardant suit. But when I did the further research, it was, it was at, it's, and still it's in my top three of best sessions ever. Oh, okay. I think I get the idea. Although quite honestly, this is like leaping off a cliff. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I don't know exactly how I'm going to even do this. I'm just gonna, you know, just take a take a leap really is what it is yes so um and it's strange. all right i think i think that's the answer is uh you know there there is no real i treat it like an ideogram so when i'm going yeah. the sketches i write the coordinate again and the last stroke of the last number i just go straight into a sketch that's very there is no disconnect okay thank you and thank if you. i picked that uh, i picked that elaboration on what i was so once i was able to observe my hand doing a sketch rather than just telling my hand what to do. It's, it's a weird thing. And now I can do it just automatically. Then Daz was uh, talking one time about how he just takes a line maybe with a curve and then he moves down a spot on the page and that line with a the curve, then suddenly kind of maybe has another curve and then he goes down. So, and he actually showed in one of these chats, I can't remember which one, his evolution of a line into in a series of, of just extending your last drawing just a little bit. Paul will actually uh, have us 
put our finger on our original drawing, kind of probe it with our offhand, and then sketch the second one while we're touching or probing the first one, mm. put your hand down to the second one. So a sketch can evolve, but like any aspect of remote viewing. It's like you're probing your original sketch to form a second sketch. Yes, yeah. And so once I started employing that from Daz's talk, I was like, whoa. And then Tom McNear in um, a talk showed a picture where he had drawn a, a, a UFO type thing. And it was the same thing. He had like five versions of the sketch on the same page. And each time a little bit more of it got filled in until he had the, the complete sketch. So right. I, th I think this is a pretty good answer and I thank you very much. Okay, good. I could add uh, another perspective on this, Russell. Yes, yes. Time. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So I, I the way I learned this uh, is a bit different originally and then it evolved over time just to give some perspective uh when i first learned this uh the way i was shown is i actually used my stage two dimensionals one at a time to help me construct spontaneously an actual stage three sketch that's not something that most crvers actually do uh it's a different methodology but it it, it was very interesting it got me started uh, i had a lot of really poor sketches from doing that, but it actually gave me kind of little bite-sized chunks of let me be spontaneous, not really care what this is in, in like uh, analytically, but I have something that's circular. Okay, here's the circular. The next stage two descriptor was, okay, I have something that is above, you know, create something spontaneously in line form that's above. And I went one by one and it got me used to, it was almost like training wheels, I feel, to a point to where I could just let my hand begin to create shapes spontaneously mm. without needing to know what they were. Uh, I'm not saying that's the end all be all, it's just the way I originally learned. Okay, um, lead, using your data to lead you into it kind of a strategy. That was the strategy, yeah, that I originally learned. And then eventually got to a point where I didn't need to do that anymore, where it was actually just completely spontaneous after that point. However, what actually occurred after this was about halfway, I mean, this was like in 20, I don't know, 15. So it was a long time ago. But for me, you see, what, I, what we're describing right now, what Russell's describing is kinesthetic is it's like you're almost letting the spontaneous reaction of your arm on the page create the shape. And I've had a lot of really amazing sketches. It's like my body, my, like the, my fingers are drawing it, not my mind. That's kinesthetic. It's the body doing it. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely a very kinesthetic individual. It's a primary modality of perception, but there's also auditory and visual. Now, auditory isn't going to help very much in the stage three, but visual is to a certain degree is what I found. And so again, this is different. This is another perspective. I'm not saying it's right or wrong compared to anyone else's. But what I discovered, and it's something I do to this day, and some of my best sketches have been using this method, is where what I actually do is I blur my eyes. I kind of let the focus go of my eyes and I look at the blank page. And with my eyes blurred, I sometimes see a very quick flash I'm not sure if you've ever gone through or are familiar with Lynn Buchanan's uh, strategy of going faster and faster images, half a second, quarter of a second, uh, an eighth of a second, et cetera, where you're trying to draw an image. What actually occurs when I do that is I actually see line forms. I don't know what it is, but I actually see, it's almost like a really like half a, a millisecond of a shape on the page. And I don't know what the shape is that kind of flashes on the page. And then what I do is I then just outline that shape. And some of my best sketches ever have been, I actually caught that. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I went back, I was like, oh my goodness, I actually got the silhouette of this thing perfectly because of that. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily a beginner friendly thing. I don't know. It's something that really just came spontaneously after years of doing this, but I figured, you know, I provide some insight on just my own personal experience. All right, but, I think uh, you're giving me some really good ideas. Yeah, just some things to just, play around with. <laughs> can I add just one more tip? Um, because when you do sketching in, in stage three, you, you don't know where you're being landed at, at the target site and your, what, what perspective you're sketching yeah. from. So I always uh, do a, uh, if I find myself a bit confused or if I want to clarify, I do a specific movement and I write this on the page and I orient, you know, I orientate myself to... Uh, ground level in front of the target at the height of 510 which is my natural height 
And then I tell myself to then sketch the target. So I, I purposely move myself into an exact position. That I know I can clarify where that target is to then try to sketch it from that angle. That's a really good idea. I should do yeah, that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. That is really great ideas. Thank you. Yeah, and, and since uh, Brett brought up this uh, time, uh, limited time perception of sketch, I'll share, you, share this with you and then, then we can uh, wrap up. If you ever get a chance to take Paul's uh, sketching course, he has a one day sketching course that he normally does in conjunction with conferences or something like that, by all means, take it. I see Joffrey's here. Joffrey and I took that one together and I'll show you an example here. So what we started with was uh, Paul's brother has uh, made up a software uh, called Tachyoscopic where it just flashes an image for a certain period of time. Hi, Lynn, how are you? You are gonna you got here late, man, we're just wrapping up, but we'll actually throw a topic at you and then you can end the show for us. So uh, we'll go a little bit past where we were. So when I'm done with this explanation, I'll tell you the topic and then you can, you can add uh, something in and that'll be the grand finale, okay? All right, good. So with this, because your, your name just came up, uh, Brett brought up your name in regards to the uh, flash of an image and then trying to sketch it. So uh, Paul had a similar thing and that's what I'm explaining. So we started out with a, uh, I don't know, maybe you'll be able to see it. So we started out with a, a one second uh, flash. So that sketch at, after one second was uh, accurate. Yeah, and looked at the feedback and okay. So, but by the time we got down to, so we went from there to half second, 186 milliseconds, six point or 66 milliseconds, 55, 35 milliseconds, 25, and then down to 20 or no 20 and then down to 15 or 10. So 20 milliseconds, just like that. I mean, you could see the, the light on the screen, but you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't like articulate what it was. So this was my sketch here. And so what the feedback on that was, was a go-kart track with a, a road and then the tire bundles to, okay. So I saw that for, for 20 milliseconds. In fact, it's funny because uh, Paul came back and goes, you, you, didn't, you didn't draw that, you know, and Joff defended me. He goes, yes, you did. I watched him do it. So how in 20 milliseconds <clears throat> could my mind have captured that much detail that I couldn't consciously recall? I couldn't have told you what that was. But when I let my hand just draw and draw those tires, and, and there was exactly four pylons of tires. I didn't, I didn't get the, uh, the concrete or the asphalt track, but I was stunned that, that an image I had uh, no um, conscious recall of could spit out that way. So now Lynn, the topic today has been, um, the main topic today uh, has been how to differentiate between the signal and the noise. And 41 people voted in the forums uh, for that. Then, so you know in advance, uh, the next time there's an open chat when Daz doesn't have a special guest, we're gonna be talking about tips, tricks, exercises, and habits for developing RV skills solo at home. And then we have three more topics, including how to create a good tasking, stages of learning, and then how to know when to end a session. So we'll be progressively doing um, these over whatever time. So on this one, either if you want to talk about what we just talked about, uh, the the flat image flash, or yeah, the uh, okay, the tachistoscope, tachistoscope program. Um, I have it for Windows, but not for Mac. Um, it will. It was originally, I did it originally for. Uh, drug interdiction so that drug agents could uh, uh, just, you know, get a, an immediate 
image of whatever they saw or whatever they were doing and immediately have a full understanding. And um, it starts you out with like 30 seconds, you see a picture, the picture goes away and then you describe it, you tell everything you know about it, the colors, the shapes, everything else. And uh, then you ask for the picture back again and you judge your results. Now in 30 seconds, you would think you can see everything about a picture, you can't. But what this program does is after you get to where you're really good at it, you can cut it down to 20 seconds, then get good at that 20 seconds. Uh, the flash of a, the refresh rate of a computer is 60, 1 60th of a second. And you can get it down to where one refresh rate of the of the computer screen, you can see a very complex picture. It flashes, goes away, and you go over and you describe it, describe the colors, everything about it, and you come back. And uh, drug agents have used this, um, police agents now, uh, artists, and um, I'm, I'm getting different libraries of, of, uh, of pictures. Um, one of them is just people. You get a flash of a person and there you can get their, their physical description. You can get their mood. You can get their ethnicity. You can get their, um, you know, um, their attitudes everything else, you can even draw pictures of them. And so this trains you to get that flash. And where this comes into remote viewing is that in remote viewing, many times the information comes to you in a flash and that's it, you know. So this program helps. I have it for Windows. I don't have a way to compile it for Apple or Linux. Um, I'm working on that, so. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm glad you're using that. Uh, I didn't know uh, I didn't know that Paul had made one of them now, but I'm, I'm glad. It's yeah, a, apparent, apparently his brother had made some sort of software program and Paul tested it out uh, in a sketching course. Oh, good deal. Yeah, good. Good deal. All right, so let's do this, Lynn, because I know everybody wants to hear your opinion on this. The main topic today is what, uh, how, how do we differentiate between signal and noise? So with your experience and however much time you want to use until we end off, what would you advise the group in terms of differentiating signal from noise? It's actually very difficult to do and almost impossible sometimes in the session. However, um, what, what I have found and what we have found over the years is that if you are doing your session and you get a perception, write it down and move on. Don't worry about whether it's signal or noise, okay? At the end of your session, you will have trusted your subconscious, you will have gained better information, you know, communication with it, and you will have more sight contact. Then at the end of your session, you've got all these pages of good stuff and garbage. <laughs> no matter how good you get at remote viewing, you're gonna have good stuff and garbage. And uh, so at the end of your session, you have good sight contact, that's where you go back and you start at the beginning of stage two, you know, after you've gotten your gestalt, the beginning of stage two, and you go through seeing what jumps out at you and what makes sense now that you have sight contact. And so it's in writing your summary that you really have to be psychic <laughs> mm -hmm. in the remote viewing. You get a perception, write it down and move on. That's it. Uh, 
and usually filtering out at the end to write your summary. That's where you will just look at the information you got and you'll say, oh, that's garbage. And you'll, oh, that's good, you know, and it filters out. Yeah, I, you know, we actually, I'm in fact, you know what, I'm going to add this to the list for future topics with no vote, which is one day we will, we should discuss summary. Um, oh, yeah. Because at first, like, I included all the bad data and left all the good data in the session. But then as, as Paul moved us through the stages, now summary, it's funny. I mean, you literally described it in the words I'm experiencing it, which is just, it's like, it sorts of, and you know, somehow you know what was good in the session and what wasn't. Right. Yeah. So with Lynn here, did, let me ask you a question, Lynn. Did you get a new camera? Oh, uh, no, I've been using this one all along. Really, your camera looks so clear. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, we have an analogy for that, if you don't mind. Go for it. Uh, I'm a rock hound, okay? When you go out hunting for gemstones, you don't go out hunting for gemstones. What you do is you go out with a bucket and a shovel and you take dirt and pile it into the bucket, okay? In remote viewing, you're getting good stuff, bad stuff. You just pile it into your session and that's it. But then after you get the bucket full, you take it up to some place where you've got a table with running water. That's where you put it out. And that's where you pick out the gemstones. Hmm. The summary is that table where you pick out the gemstones. And then um, Gail Husick, the project, uh, project manager, um, she <laughs> likes for me to go ahead and finish that analogy that then after you get the gemstones, that's where you pass it to somebody who knows what's going on to evaluate it, you know, it's a process. Okay, so with Lynn here, and let's say we'll go another 10 minutes, is there anybody here on topic with a question for Lynn? Hi, I have a question for Lynn. Um, your tachistoscope program, I'd really love to have a go with it. Is there anywhere we can download it from? Uh, do you have Windows? Uh, yeah, I can do. Okay. Um, uh, I've always had plans to sell this, but I'm never going to get around to doing it. So um, let me try to find it on my machine, and if I can put it into the... Uh, chat room um actually it's too big because it has libraries of uh right now it has over 600 pictures in it uh select them at random and all that so it won't i don't think it'll go into the chat room lynn can um, you can you pick um a, a forum to post it in dazes or you know, like if you wanted to post that in Daz's forum and then everybody could go there or with what would yeah, we, we could yeah. do that. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Hey, Coral, could you be the the administrator of that? I, I, I can sort out the tech side of it. Okay, so yes. Uh, okay, so That's so great. we're set. Thank you, Lynn. So we're sure. set with a way for David to get that and then anybody else who wants it. With okay. Lynn's blessing, and then we'd really like somebody to rewrite it for us into Mac as oh. well. Okay. Please. Okay. So at some point between Lynn and Coral, that uh, process will get posted in Daz's, Daz's Facebook group, Remote Viewers and Remote Viewing. And, uh, oh, you mean just to the um, Facebook yeah, I think that would be the best universal way, don't you? Yeah, okay. Uh huh. And I think I said is remote viewing and remote viewers, right? I said it back sure. the first time. Yeah. Okay. Is there another question for Lynn? Come on, don't be shy. A uh, contribution process would be nice. I've always planned to sell this. Uh, 
I've given it to the drug and to the uh, police departments. Um, if you want, Lynn, I can sell it up on my uh, on my remote viewed website with a PayPal link to you or something. If you want donations, that'd be great. Yeah, um, yeah, that would be really nice, Daz. That's I'll work with Carl on that. We'll, yeah, we'll we'll set something yeah. up. Okay, yeah. so then when that's set up, will you make an announcement in your group? Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 we can put the links in in the uh, in the Facebook groups then. Okay, awesome. Okay, good deal. So we have that situated. Anybody else have a question on the topic of noise versus signal? Uh, while Lynn is I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Martin. Go ahead. Um, I've got a tendency to sometimes close my eyes when I view, and uh, I think I've been told to keep them open. Is it ever wrong to close your eyes while you're viewing? Not Together. really, but the, the problem is that uh, closing your eyes gives you an almost immediate uh, hit of alpha waves. And many times that will cause stray cats or AOLs to happen. Uh, uh, so this is one of the reasons why Ingo said, uh, keep your eyes open. Uh, if you can, um, if you can get past that hit of alpha waves and the imagery or whatever it causes, uh, then it's not so bad. But that's why Ingo said, uh, "Keep your eyes open." Okay, thanks. I have a question if if nobody else has questions. Yeah, I was sorry to be late. Sorry to be late. It's been a bad day. <laughs> well, next time we're going to uh, pre-invite you. Paul was here for a while. Um, Brett Stewart chimed in. So the more of you experienced folks, the better uh, the audience enjoys it. So I think what I'll do next time is take the liberty of nagging you a little bit, OK? Thank you. Yeah. Good. All right, Kial, go ahead. Uh, it's basically, I'm throwing a red herring in there, but the, my question is for you, Lynn, uh, do you suggest a sort, a, a sort of state of mind? And I know that's so obvious a question, but for example, in my case, these days, if I go outside and stay outside for 15 minutes, my sessions seem to be going better. Good. Yeah. And, uh, it's called a cool down and, uh, different cool downs work for different people. Uh, I know some people uh meditate for five minutes some people uh play music some people just go out and walk around um you have to find out what works for you i know one of my students goes out and stacks rocks and the attention that it takes to stack those rocks gets his mind off of everything else um i tried all these different ways and for me personally if i mow the lawn, wash the car, do my session, do something else, do something else, just whap, 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 with no preparation. That's when I get the best results in my session. And judging your session after you do the different types of, of cool down, the session results is what you judge the cool down by. So like you said, going out and taking a walk. You come back, you have better sessions. Um, that's, that's, your, that's your feedback as to what works for you. But yeah, a cool down for different people. I know Paul Smith listens to uh, this gosh awful acid rock music and you know, drive me up a wall, but, uh, but it works for him. And that's the thing, you have to find out what works for you. And one, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Cal, Cal, did you have more? Okay, one update on that for you, uh, Lynn, is Paul does not, no longer do that. He, oh, really? uh, correct, he um, taught us saying that if he could go back and do it again, as much as he loved 80s rock, he would do basically what you described, um, nothing. Just make it part of your day. Go about, uh, so he said, if I had it to do over again, I would just sit down and do the session. Yeah. So I oh, started, I that. 
I started that myself right out of basic when he said it. I've never I've done a cool down. It's just like, oh, I better, you know, I got an email with a target number. I better get uh, some paper and pencil. And I just do it, like you say, in just the normal course of the day without isolating it, overemphasizing it, putting too much attention on it, working up the drama and the nerves, just sit down and do it. So absolutely. Yeah. It's just another thing you're capable of doing it. So just sit down and do it. Yeah. Exactly. All I have right. A question. I, Real quick. I, I have a question. Okay. Okay. okay Ida, go, go ahead. ahead. Lynn and Russell and whoever else. What is the deal about black ink? <laughs> if you, okay, I, heard you some, I heard somebody laughing. <laughs> if you believe that you have to have black ink, then the problem is your belief. <laughs> uh, if, if you believe that you have to have purple ink in order to view, then get a purple pen, you know. Uh, the fact is that um, in the military, we had what we called ingo pens. They were um, um, pilot felt tip pens. And, uh, and that's what we use because that's what the army provided. The <laughs> army stopped using it. When they did, our inks, you know, our pens went dry. We start all those pens that somehow made it home with us started coming back to to work from home. And uh, when we ran out of those, it, it dawned on us. You know, we have to learn to do this with pencils, pens with our finger, and uh, and you get to where you can do your ideograms on the side of a roulette table with your finger and get accurate. What's it gonna be, red, green, or black, you know? And uh, it's your belief. Black ink doesn't matter. Okay, well, from my background, everything we had to use blue i mean we in in my professional career which was in healthcare we had to use blue and we had to do a certain um signature at the end of notes and everything was in blue and so in my mind you know, and then when I taught, I didn't even use a red pen. I mean, I barely used a pink pen to, but all these years, and, and then I get, you know, it's listed in the syllabus, must use black pen. I almost bought a Sharpie, but that would have been too much. So I just, I had to ask that question. You can pick up a charcoal, charcoal stick from an artist and and do your session. You can uh, you can use pencil. You can use anything. Thank you. Know, you. It's, uh, it's your belief that counts. Okay, it's your now faith, your faith. I, that well, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lynn. Go ahead. Um, I'm I'm just talking. Yeah. Okay, now Ida, put your mind at ease. I cannot tell you how much that has been dry. You know, I had to special order black pens because I had none in the house. Everything for my professional career was all about blue because a blue signature, uh, in other words, if you sign something in black, how do they know if it's a copy or if it's your signature? But if it's is signed in blue, then that's, you know, of course this is the day before color copiers folks, yeah. but um, everything professional had to be signed in blue written in blue so that a copy was differentiated so what you have to realize is you have been trained At, with that absolutely and, yeah okay All right. now i heard a, a male voice speak up about the same time as i i didn't hear who it was yeah that was that was me russell oh brett i just yes, had a, go ahead. Yeah, I had a just a real quick lynn i had a speculative kind of question for you because i know you're rather uh, technologically informed, or at least you have uh, some specialty there. Um, this is a random question for you about signal to noise and just technology. 
if you had unlimited funds to attempt to create some sort of a device that aided with remote viewing, what would that look like to you? Where would you go first? I'm just curious if you've ever thought about that and where you would start looking first. Uh, my first question is, is this an offer for unlimited funds? No. <laughs> I wish, I wish. Yeah. No, it's more yeah. of a speculative question. Yeah. Maybe one day. Um, one of the things I've been curious about and uh, don't have the money to do because it would take all kinds of equipment. If you had a computer with virtual reality goggles that you could use for 10 different viewers and you had them all working on the same target at the same time in the same place, would you be able to build a virtual reality of the target? Now that's pie in the sky stuff, I don't know. If I had unlimited funds, I would, uh, first of all, I would make training more available to more people and I would take the cream of the crop and start paying them a salary to be remote viewers. Um, that would be that would be my choice for unlimited funds. Fair enough. Thanks. Okay. Now that sounds like a wonderful place to end. Brad is going to give Lynn tons of cash, and then Lynn is going to employ us. <laughs> So I, that that sounds. I, I, I heard Brett make that offer very clearly. Oh so, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> that is very. Don't clear. worry, it's recorded. <laughs> we got it all. All right, everybody. I want to say to you, this this has really been one of my very favorite chats. The the topic specific to to practice, everybody's input, the great questions. So I I really enjoyed this today, and and I appreciate it. What we'll do is when Daz has uh, openings from his special guests, then we'll proceed down the list of the voted topics and just continue. It, it's been great. So I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Lynn, thank you for showing up. And next time I am going to prompt you to be on time. I tried to be this time and life gets in the way. I understand. I apologize. Yeah. Oh, no problem. But but it's such a nice contribution. You know, Paul sat and answered a, a few questions, and Daz has put his input, and and Brett. So I'll I'll just I'll just remind you next time. All right, everybody, we're going to call this a wrap. Daz, uh, I'm going to um, process the video, um, Dropbox it to Daz, and then at his convenience, he'll get it up on YouTube, and then we'll uh, post it around in the groups. So thank you, everybody, and have a good day. Thank you, Russell, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Russell. Thanks. Take thank care. You, thank you. Good night. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.